Yeah. So it's a great pleasure to have Professor Aninder Sinha from uh, Center for High Energy Physics, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Uh, yeah, like uh, I know everybody knows Professor Sinha, but those who don't know for them, I just want to give small introduction. So he did his PhD from Cambridge uh, with uh, Michael Green. And uh, then he also worked at Perimeter as a postdoc with uh, Rob Myers. And there he uh, was actually uh, worked with a very famous topic, which is called holographic C theorems in quantum field theories always. And also he worked with uh, uh, many other topics particularly bootstrap and entanglement entropy. So he will talk about uh, something about bootstrap. So I just forgot your title. Uh, what's the title? Can you able Bootstrapping to CFTs and QFTs. Yeah, so uh, he will talk about bootstrapping uh, CFTs and QFTs today. And uh, apart from that theoretical side, he also collaborating with his wife uh, from uh, uh, Raman Research Institute, uh, Urvashi Sinha, on some uh, experimental verification and tabletop experiments uh, related to quantum information. So he works both in the theory and the experimental side. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not an experimentalist. No, 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 don't, don't, don't do that sacrilege. Yes. So, yeah, yeah uh, you can start. Yeah, thank you very much, Anton, for this uh, kind introduction. And uh, also don't call me an experimentalist. I think that is going to infuriate my wife a lot. Uh, <laughs> so this is a disclaimer that I'm not an experimentalist. Uh, but uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, so the title of my talk is Bootstrapping CFTs and QFTs. Um, and as Shantan said, and let me just repeat it, you can uh, pause, you can ask me questions by stopping me whenever uh, you want. Uh, so, you know, everything has gone online, so uh, I, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure you can hear me, but uh, there's apparently a meme on somebody giving a one-hour video lecture with audio on mute, so I'm, I'm sure you can all, all of you can hear me. And also, uh, I do hope that you'll uh, listen to me uh, uh, for two hours. That's what Shandan told me, that uh, I should prepare a two-hour lecture, so you have been warned. I also hope that you're going to be an on-shell listener, so this is an on-shell listener rather than an off-shell listener. So you do, 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 uh, do ask questions uh, and be active. So uh, let me just begin. I will talk about two extreme problems in physics, an extreme in some sense. Uh, maybe they are basically in the same category. But one problem is going to be about critical exponents of material, which is in, in the same universality class. Um, and as an example, it's in the same universality class as a three-dimensionalizing model, for example, water. But it could also be generalizations of this example, like superfluid helium and so on. So these are literally uh, things that can be experimentally measured. It's not uh, something that uh, is just of pure, pure theoretical interest. And the second example, again, uh, which is of experimental interest, is scattering of hadrons and uh, pions, to be specific, in massive quantum field theory. So I will. Uh, given more details as the talk goes on. Um, and the tools that I'm going to use are going to be the same. It's going to be uh, bootstrap. The technology will be a little different from, uh, for, for both the problems, and I will explain what these are. But the, there'll be a lot of common philosophies, uh, and some of the methods also will appear to be common. So uh, the way that uh, you would understand critical phenomena, the way that it is conventionally taught, uh, would be via field theory. Uh, and uh, the first problem that I'm going to discuss, is, which is the famous epsilon expansion, is typically something that, um, that is taught, uh, at least a version of it is taught in the first uh, quantum field theory course that you would take. Uh, it's, it's the 5 to the 4 theory. Um, although maybe uh, you're not uh, explained the applications of 5 to the 4, but uh, presumably you would have calculated at least one critical exponent. And these critical exponents are exp experimentally measurable. The second example, which uh, deals with pion scattering, is depending on which where you're doing a quantum field theory course, is, is usually rarely taught in uh, courses. Uh, and one famous approach uh, to understanding this problem theoretically is what is uh, called the chiral perturbation theory. Um, 
and I should warn you that uh, from the bootstrap side, uh, both these problems are being um, actively developed and improved by several brilliant groups. And I will uh, not be able to do justice uh, to all, uh, all the brilliant work that is going on in the world. Uh, and I will present, a, a, which will turn out to be a pretty biased view. Uh, namely, I will uh, discuss problems that I find interesting or, or which, which, which have direct overlap with what I'm doing. So the first problem, let's uh, get warmed up uh, just to uh, explain where we are going, um, is the problem of critical exponents. Uh, so this is, the, this is the famous diagram. This is the phase diagram of water. And uh, as you all know that uh, in the phase diagram of water, there is a critical point. I hope my mouse pointer is visible. Um, so this is the critical point, and it is uh, supposed to be described by a conformal field theory. Uh, it is also supposed to be described by the physics of the three-dimensional three Ising model. Um, and at that critical point, one can measure various parameters called critical exponents. So for example, you can measure the specific heat. And this is uh, uh, of water. I mean, you, you can't literally measure that of water, but you re require to consider some, uh, some mixture. Uh, so this is the heat capacity of this mixture. Uh, and uh, the heat capacity diverges in a, in a certain way, and the way that it diverges is, is uh, controlled by a critical exponent. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, alpha turns out to be the same for many different substances, so not just water, but if you consider it for other materials or many other materials, it works out to be the same. Uh, the most uh, well understood, or the, uh, at least this is the propaganda uh, that uh, the most precise measurement of, of any critical exponent is that of superfluid helium, uh, which was measured uh, on the space shuttle. And this was done in the early 1990s and various uh, analysis have been done afterwards. Um, and uh, as I said, that there are lots of materials which have uh, the same critical exponents, so not just water, carbon dioxide, argon, methanol, cyclohexane, these are all mixtures. They have all uh, they have the same critical exponents, whereas uh, helium four and this is uh, cesium manganese fluoride, uh, they have different critical exponents which differ from water, but uh, they also uh, form another univers universality class, which is called the O2 universality class. So this is the Ising, and this is the XY or the O2 universality class. Okay. So that was some, some background about the first problem. Uh, the second problem, which has to do with uh, pion scattering. So first of all, you literally cannot make pions and scatter them like you can do with protons. I mean, it's, it's not something that you can readily make in a lab because the lifetime of a pion is very, very small. It's, it's like 10 to the power minus 15 seconds uh, or 10 to the power minus eight seconds, depending on which pion you're considering. And uh, so you can study pion scattering only indirectly, uh, but Nonetheless, a lot can be inferred, and it is a problem of enormous interest for a very, very long time. It's, it's uh, one of the most considered processes for a lot of axiomatic quantum field theory studies, like high energy bounds. So if you, if you wanted to consider, say, uh, uh, what happens at very high energies, say, uh, if you're considering the forward limit, very large uh, uh, S, S is the Mandel's time variable, and if you consider these high energy bounds, the, the, the most famous high energy bounds that arises from axiomatic quantum field theory is called the Frossard bound, then you would consider a process of this kind. And the reason is that you, for this process, you have a simple an analytic structure in the complex S plane. I will make all this more precise as the talk goes along, but I thought I'll, uh, I'll mention some background about both the topics of study uh, as we go along. And uh, there are a lot of, uh, uh, experimental uh, sort of in indirectly measured experimental observables in the pion scattering uh, that you can uh, you can set yourself set yourself a target that if you if you had a theory so for example if you wanted to study bootstrap and uh, you you wanted to say uh, you wanted to claim that you you can uh, explain uh, the standard model then one target would be that you have to reproduce these scattering lengths so these are uh, values for various scattering lengths um, uh, there are S wave, E wave, D wave scattering lengths. I'll make them more precise. The A's are the scattering lengths and, and B's are the effective ranges. Uh, so this is something that uh, follows from non-relativistic quantum mechanics. But these are sort of known, uh, again, as I said, uh, because you cannot measure them directly, you infer them indirectly. There's some model dependencies in these uh, numbers, but roughly speaking, they're the same. And they have been 
studied for a very long time again. Uh, it was, uh, in, even in the 1970s, even in the 1960s, uh, people knew something about these things. And I have uh, quoted these numbers from a kind of an old but very, very famous review uh, from 2001. And uh, uh, these numbers are getting updated. So I think that the best place to uh, know about the latest numbers uh, would be the particle data. Uh, so the other thing about pions, which you should be aware of, uh, and which actually uh, created a lot of interest and it led to the birth of string theory is this behavior called Rege behavior. So if you look at the, uh, 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 the light mesons, if you looked at the light unflavored mesons, and you did the following plots, you plotted the spin versus mass square, uh, you would get roughly a straight line. It's roughly a straight line, it's not really a straight line, but you know, uh, at, as first approximation as a theorist, you would say that the, these are straight lines. Um, and this is called uh, Rege behavior. So oh, on the y-axis, we have the spin, and on the x-axis, we have m squared. Uh, this uh, was first considered by Jeffrey Chu and Frotschi, and it, it goes by the name of the chu frotschi plot. Um, and so any theory of strong interactions should be able to explain uh, this Rege behavior. So roughly speaking, uh, you can do a fit. J, uh, you can do a fit uh, considering T to be small, and uh, you will get something that looks like this. So there will be some intercept, there will be some slope. So if only these two terms were there, this would be purely linear. But if there is a T squared, then there would be a, a curvature. So it, it, uh, it's not really a straight line. It, it, it does have some curvature. And experimental uh, results actually say that the curvature should be positive. Uh, in other words, the, the graph should be concave. And so it is, it is kind of known. Um, I guess it is known reasonably well that at least for the light unflavored mesons, the curvature should be positive. So alpha 2 here, this should be um, positive in sign. So any theory, if you, uh, if you, if you are studying holography, and uh, I believe that there was an old study, and since Carlos is here, there's some old study uh, uh, using the Maldacena Nunes background, which can produce this positive curvature. Um, but anyhow, uh, you would like to have a general kind of understanding why this curvature is positive. So if you claim that you understand your theory, you should be able to explain these, at least this gross feature. Um, and of course, historically, uh, this is the plot, the Rege behavior is what um, led to the birth of string theory. So this was a challenge in the 1960s to come up with some model uh, which was consistent with crossing, but uh, exhibited this, uh, this behavior. And then Veneziano came and uh, gave us the first uh, example, which, uh, which was consistent with both. So let me just uh, turn to the first uh, uh, example, which is bootstrapping CFT. So using bo uh, the bootstrap method in CFTs, we are going to try and understand critical exponents. And this again requires a bit of background. So let me just develop that background. Uh, so there are the, the Ising model is a very famous model. It was first proposed, uh, first uh, the first uh, I, uh, model was solved by Ernst Ising in one dimension in 1925. This was his PhD thesis problem. Uh, the 2D is a very famous uh, problem which was solved by Lance Onsager in 1944. And for this and other contributions that he did to chemistry, he got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1968. And the 3D is, uh, of course, something that is still a challenge. We don't have a, an analytic solution. Forget about as a function of temperature, but also uh, even, even at the critical point, we don't have any understanding analytically. Uh, and um, as far as I understand, Murray Gelman suggested this as a thesis problem to his student, Ken Wilson. So Wilson, of course, did not solve the 3D Ising model, but he came close to it. He invented the renormalization group. Uh, so it was a pretty decent problem to have as a thesis problem. Uh, and uh, before I proceed so that I have everybody on board and I don't lose you, I'm going to frequently use some terminology. Uh, so let's get that terminology out of the way. Uh, so I will frequently use this uh, terminology conformal dimension. So O is some uh, operator. You can uh, think of it as, as some primary operator if you know the, what it means. If you don't know what it means, it, uh, don't, don't worry about it. It's some operator in the, in the theory. Uh, and uh, X is the position. So if you consider the expectation value or the correlation function, then it has some kind of a, of a fall off. 
that that is governed by the conformal dimension of this operator. So if I mention the words conformal dimension, this is what you should have in mind that uh, this is controlling how, how things fall off in the two-point function. The other thing that uh, I will sometimes use is uh, this nomenclature called OPE coefficient. OPE stands for operator product expansion. And uh, when I use the, uh, this set of words, uh, you should think of it uh, as what arises from a three-point function. So a three-point function of three operators is proportional, and these don't have to be the same operators either. So although I've, meant, I've written it as if they're the same, they could be different. Uh, the three-point function is proportional to some coefficient, which is called the OPE coefficient, times some function of x and y. Uh, and this function is fixed by conformal symmetry. So there is a part of the correlation function, this three-point function, which is governed by conformal symmetry. And there is some number that sits in front. There could be relative numbers as well. So those numbers are what are called OP coefficients. And uh, so this is what uh, you should have in mind when I use these words. Uh, there are more precise ways of thing, saying things, but roughly speaking, this is what I mean. So uh, again, uh, just to make sure that I don't lose, I will sometimes use this uh, notation delta subscript phi. Um, and this is related to a particular critical exponent. It tells you how correlation functions fall off. So here in, in the bottom of my slide, you can see this correlation function falling off and the fall off is governed by this critical exponent eta. And delta of phi, or in this particular case, delta of psi would be given uh, by, by this formula. Similarly, when I talk about delta phi square, so phi square, you can think of it as a composite operator. So in a weakly coupled theory, like say phi, phi four theory, it is literally phi square. Uh, you, you can uh, think of the phi square, the mass operator, m square phi square, that phi square. And that uh, controls the critical, uh, the critical exponent alpha, which tells us uh, how the specific heat diverges at the critical point. So this is the importance of these two uh, uh, scaling dimension or conformal dimension. So they are used sometimes interchangeably. So uh, if I talk about delta phi squared, then this is what I mean, and delta phi is going to so, control the following. Uh, what does delta phi refer to again? So phi would be the scaling dimension. So in, in the phi to the fourth theory, it would be the scaling dimension of the field phi at the critical point. So, um, and it also controls for you how the uh, two-point function of phi uh, behaves. So in, the, in this equation that you can see uh, where my mm -hmm. pointer is circling, it tells you how the correlation function falls off. And delta phi square is the yeah. So it is the it is the it is the conformal dimension of the composite operator phi square. Okay. So, most, yeah. so you can do the, all these studies uh, if you were a theorist, then you would do this uh, do these studies also on a lattice. So for instance, easily you can ask your uh, undergraduate to reproduce some of these results using the two-dimensionalizing model, and they can they can compute for you very quickly. Uh, what these critical exponents there are. The two-dimensionalizing model, of course, is very well understood. It, it, it has an analytic solution, so uh, you can just compare things very, very nicely. Okay, so one of the very many legacies of Ken Wilson, of course, he gave us a lot of uh, things, but one of the many uh, legacies is what is called the epsilon expansion. So this is something that some of you may be familiar with, but if you're not, let me just review what, what it means. So Wilson said that uh, it makes sense, and sometimes it's also useful to think about a quantum field theory in fractional dimensions. So literally, uh, when, he's, when he says here quantum field theory models in less than four dimensions, he literally is thinking about four minus epsilon, and he is going to treat epsilon to be small, and he's going to do an expansion in that parameter epsilon. And this was in 1972. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's quite interesting historical, from a historical point of view, how things proceed. So you, uh, you will, uh, if you if you can keep these dates in mind, because it will turn out that the the S matrix bootstrap was being developed in the 1960s, and the conformal bootstrap was roughly being developed along around, along the, uh, this time, and both these bootstrap methods uh, had an unfortunate uh, fate at that point of time, because the S matrix bootstrap uh, was sort of shelved because QCD came along. And the uh, conformal bootstrap was essentially shelved because uh, the renormalization group came along. But if you wanted to calculate these critical exponents, uh, so by critical exponents, I would mean you calculate the conformal dimension delta phi and delta phi square. I will, I will explain to you uh, how these are calculated in words in a bit. You would need to calculate a bunch of Feynman diagrams. And typically, uh, you can see that here, the number of diagrams that is there in Wilson's original paper, this was the first paper that he wrote. 
uh, this was in 1972, and then he and Fisher wrote another paper later on. So sometimes it's called the Wilson Fisher uh, fixed point, which describes this critical theory. You will see that he uh, not only calculates one loop diagrams, but he also calculates two loop diagrams, and there is one three loop diagram that he has to calculate. And of course, I have never calculated a three loop diagram in my life. I mean, maybe some of you have managed to calculate this diagram, but basically, already this looks quite frightening and uh, it seems like it will involve a lot of work. Um, and uh, you can do a counting of the number of diagrams that you need to calculate. So there are 10 diagrams. If you just do quickly count the number of diagrams, there are 10 diagrams to get, uh, get to this order. So what is the epsilon expansion? So you start off with uh, the famous phi to the fourth theory. This is something that everybody encounters in a, in a standard quantum field theory one course. This is just a slight generalizations of the phi to the fourth theory. This is the ON model. So there are N scalars. So phi i, i here ranges from one to N. So there are N scalars. And this is your phi to the four interaction, but written in some ON invariant way. Uh, the only difference is uh, that I'm going to consider this theory uh, following Wilson and Fisher. This is Ken Wilson and this is Fisher. Uh, you want to consider this theory in four minus epsilon dimension. And you want to treat epsilon to be small. So it turns out that when you calculate the beta function, your beta function, the fixed point, so there is a lambda here, this is a coupling. So at the fixed point, lambda takes on some value lambda star, which is proportional to epsilon. The proportionality constant is actually quite big. So lambda star is 16 pi squared by three times epsilon. So unless epsilon is small, so 16 pi squared is rough, uh, by three is roughly 50. So it's like 50 times epsilon, maybe a bit more than that, but anyway, 50 times epsilon. So unless epsilon is small, your lambda is not really small. And what do you want to do ultimately? So you want to calculate the critical exponents of the 3D Ising model. So you want to set epsilon equal to one at the end of your calculation. So that is, the, that is what you want to do. Whether it is mathematically sensible or not, that is a separate question, but that is what you want to start off by doing. So you pretend that epsilon is small, you do your calculation, you calculate your critical exponent by solving the kalan simonsic equations, you calculate the scaling dimension, whatever you can, you calculate in an epsilon expansion. So when you do that, nothing is undetermined because everything is in terms of epsilon. Once you identify what dimension you're working in, that becomes sacred. So things uh, like you, uh, you might have encountered that, you know, there is some uh, redefinition freedom that is there in the renormalization group equations, those all go away. So in fact, uh, there is no such freedom once you identify the dimensionality is four minus epsilon and uh, the critical exponents then become a systematic expansion order by order in epsilon. And you can seriously calculate what is sitting in front, front of these each order in epsilon. So uh, I have a question that- Yes. Yeah, so by small epsilon means how much small? Like ah, yeah, so, so, so let, uh, those are the kind of questions that you address and you, you get addressed, don't worry. Okay. So ultimately, but the bottom line is you, you will need to calculate up to some order. So that means that you have to calculate a bunch of Feynman diagrams, some loop, loop diagrams that you have to calculate. Okay. You, you get some answer and then you throw your hand up in the air, you put epsilon secretly to one and see what number you get. Okay. Then you do, then you ask these more refined questions that uh, was it a sensible thing to put epsilon equal to one or did you have to resum your series? Was the series asymptotic or was it convergent? So those kind of things are refined questions and you can ask them. But this is what they did in uh, originally. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I also have a question. Yes. So, like, uh, it's a very naive question, and like, I don't understand, like, uh, uh, what's going to be the metric till we fix the epsilon? Uh, what is going to be the what? Sorry. Uh, the metric. How are you going to define the metric? Metric. You fix epsilon. No, this yeah. is in flat space. This is in flat space. Uh, like, so if this is not in curved space. Are fractional. Yes. Are oh yeah. So 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 you want to write down a, a metric. So you want to write down dx squared plus d1. Uh, yeah. So all yeah, those yeah, yeah, sure. you pretend that you're doing the calculation in d dimensions and then do analytic continuation. So you get a formula in terms of d, and in that formula you can set d equal to four minus epsilon. So of course, uh, from that point of view, it's not a. It doesn't appear to be a sensible thing to do. You're absolutely right. But you know, it's a calculational framework. You want to see how far you can push it, and you will see that uh, there is some merit in doing this. And, and is there any motivation that uh, this should be like, this should even be considered as an approach? Of course, we now know that it works. Excellent question. So why don't we hold on and then we can, we can uh, address them. Yeah, sure. Yeah. sure, sure. Thank you. Okay. 
So uh, in this theory, various uh, values of n and epsilon correspond to various famous theories. So for example, n equal to one and epsilon equal to one gives you the 3D Ising model. This will uh, give you the critical point of water. Uh, if you put n equal to one and epsilon equal to two, so you're going very, very, uh, you're doing something really crazy. So you start off by saying that epsilon is one and then you ultimately land up putting epsilon equal to one or epsilon equal to two. Uh, so you're doing something crazy here, but uh, let's, let's pretend that we can do that. Let's see where it goes. You'll get the 2D Ising model. So 2D Ising model, of course, as I told you, it's uh, analytic results are known. So you can do this crazy thing and you can compare with what, what is actually analytically known. And you can also consider the XY model, which is uh, for the superfluid helium. Okay. So, so let us uh, consider, um, so let us consider what is happening uh, to the scaling dimension or the conformal dimension phi. So this was this 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 formula that I've written here was there in uh, Wilson's original paper. You can, for example, open uh, the famous report by Wilson and Covert, and you will see exactly this formula. So they did this calculation. Uh, I will review what is in the, what is the state of the art later on. But then this is already there in their paper. So this is the conformal dimension of the fundamental field phi. So this is the fundamental scalar. And this result by computing those bunch of Feynman diagrams I showed you those ten diagrams. There's, there was only one three loop diagram you can get the epsilon cubed result. And you can do this exercise. You can put B equal to whatever you want and uh, N equal to whatever you want and check. So you can do this. So here is uh, the first example. So you can put N equal to one and you can consider this drastic approximation where you have set epsilon equal to two. And you get uh, the number 0.11. You can easily calculate, you can verify this. And as I said, that uh, the 2D Ising model is exactly solvable. So you know the answer. So it's actually one over eight and one over eight is 0.125. So you've done this, this really crazy thing, but you, you're not too far from the answer. So it's, it's doing pretty well. And you can ask, why is this working? And you might be thinking that, oh, secretly, maybe there's a small parameter that is sitting in front of epsilon that makes it sensible. No such thing. Uh, I can already tell you, and you should do this exercise. You can verify this number is not really small. This, there's no effective coupling in front. You can do it for t equal to three, which is the three dimensional Ising model. You'll get the number 0.5519. And numerically, so this is from numerical bootstrap or Monte Carlo, you get the number 0.518. And this is known quite precisely. I think it's known up to six or seven decimal places. You can also compare with experiments because uh, two dimension also, the, the, there are some theories which, uh, there are some experimental way of getting this. Uh, which I have not uh, followed up on, but uh, three dimensional, of course, you can do the experiment. I uh, showed you uh, the setups as well. You get the number 0.52, which is oh, roughly speaking, the same result. So the epsilon expansion seems to be doing pretty well. And I'm not still justifying that this is a sensible thing to do. I will address all that in a bit. So, so these are till order three? Uh, so this is up, uh, so I, you can do the calculation up till three decimal places. I've just, for convenience, I've uh, exhibited up till three decimal places. But no, basically, you can do it up till um, you can have many more decimal places. So, in order uh, orders of epsilon, it is it an order yes, three? Yes, this, is, this is up till order three. Yes, I will no. tell you the state of the art in a bit. Uh, this is not the state of the art. I'm uh, I'm reviewing what Wilson and Cobert had done in the 1970s. It might not match for fourth order. Uh, yes, it might move away. From yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, I will tell you what the state of the art is. What what how you should do it. I'm just uh, telling you historically what you would have done if you were in 1970s. And then you can do this for the XY model as well. You'll get something that is okay, kind of, again, starts deviating a bit more, so on. Anyhow, so the epsilon expansion seems to be a good first bet to see where things are. And when I say numerical things, I should mention that uh, the, these are results from uh, this very famous uh, reincarnation of the bootstrap, which was uh, pioneered by Ratazzi, Richkov, Vicky, and Tony in, in 2008. And many, many people have developed on it. Uh, the, the numbers that I quote here are, are from these papers uh, on the 3D and the Ising model, which are quite old. There are more recent numbers, as, as recent as 2019. Yes. Uh, so uh, the reason we start from uh, dimension four. Yes. Right, in doing the epsilon expansion is because in four dimensions, uh, the theory is uh, is uh, free. Right? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. So it uh, there's a Gaussian fixed point in four dimensions. So you know that it's renormalizable, and you can. 
uh, if you if you do the calculation below four dimensions, then you know that you will get a fixed point. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. So these numbers numerically are often uh, quoted uh, in, even in the condensed matter literature by very famous people. They are also quoted as the most accurate numerical estimates for the three D IZ model. So in fact, if you had a if, if you if you specialize in doing Monte Carlo simulations. The error is uh, your error estimates has to improve on what the uh, what, what 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 these uh, folks get from the bootstrap. Okay, so and then let me just summarize what happens for the phi square operator. Phi square is a composite operator. Remember that this was related to the specific heat; it can be measured. Uh, you can do the so. Uh, curious fact is that with the ten diagrams, which has one three loop diagram you get up to epsilon square for phi square. So if you wanted to go to epsilon cubed for phi square, you will start getting, uh, you need to calculate higher order diagrams, more diagrams. Um, another thing that I should have pointed out, uh, it, it, it's a curiosity, but uh, I think it's worth pointing out. See, these are rational numbers. So uh, these you'll get as fractions. If you went to the next order from epsilon to the four, you start seeing irrational numbers. You start seeing zeta threes. And that's also kind of, uh, Kind of interesting how the irrationality repackages itself order by order in epsilon. So here for delta phi square, the irra irrationality is going to kick in at epsilon cube itself. Anyhow, you can do the same exercise uh, that I uh, that I mentioned in the previous slide, and you'll get reasonable agreement. Again, it's reasonable. Uh, you can see that you're doing something really drastically, uh, seeming seemingly mathematically no nonsensical thing, but you still get something reasonable. Even for the two-dimensional case where you put epsilon equal to two, you get 1.14 as your answer, and the actual answer is one. So you, you've not done too badly. And uh, again, there was some discrepancy so far as the experimental result is concerned, and uh, bootstrap people felt that maybe they, they could improve upon it, but it turns out that, in fact, uh, bootstrap sided with uh, the Monte Carlo simulation, and presumably there's some errors that the space shuttle experiment was had which which wasn't taken into account or it could be that superfluid helium is not in this university class strictly speaking anyhow so the bottom line is you you can do this calculation you have to work very hard even to do this three loop calculation you you you're not taught to do the three loop calculation in a, in a first course in quantum field theory in principle you can do it but you'll see you, you, you will find that it is very hard so what do you do? So you have to first learn how to re regularize, renormalize, you have to remove infinities in a very specific way, which is completely standard and well understood. Then you have to locate the fixed point of the beta function so that you have scale invariance. And this is going to relate the coupling with epsilon. And then uh, you have to use some more technology to get, uh, get in information. And you are only getting information about the conformal dimension. So in the, in the, uh, in the lexicographic slide, I told you that there are two things that I'm going to use. One of them is the conformal dimension, which tells you how things fall off, the correlation functions fall off in two-point functions. And the other thing was the OPE coefficient. So here, I have not mentioned about OPE coefficients. OPE coefficients turn out to be quite hard to calculate in this framework. The bottom line is that this Feynman diagram machinery, uh, in principle, gives you an algorithm to go to any order that you want. But in practice, it is quite technical and tedious, but the framework is very well understood. And this is the state of the art. So the state of the art, only recently, people have gone to six loops. The state of the art is five loops for um, the phi and phi square operator. Uh, people have gone to six loops recently, I think maybe a year or a couple of years back. Um, and you can do this for delta phi, you can do this for phi square. And also, there are other operators in the theory. Phi and phi square are not the only operators in the theory, there are also gradient operators. So, gradient operators look like phi derivatives, many bunch of derivatives times phi. So, that's a gradient operator. There could be more composite operators like phi to the four and so on. So it works out to be very difficult to calculate systematically for all these operators. So for instance, for these gradient operators, only four loop values are still known. Uh, for the higher composite operators, even lower loop results and so on and so on. Basically it becomes very complicated. And anyhow, the bottom line is, and the, of course this is a question that Shantan was asking that uh, what is the value of epsilon that you are allowed to choose? The series is asymptotic. So it has got zero radius of convergence. You know that it's, 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 going, it's asymptotic, so you, it does not matter what value of epsilon you're, you're going to put in. You require some resummation methods 
to make sense of the result anyway. And uh, the uh, the order epsilon to the k behaves in this way. So although there is this exponential of minus k suppression, this k to the power k overtakes it. And so basically, for very large orders of k, uh, it, does, it, it will uh, it will stop making sense. So and this was known paper, very early. This paper yeah. actually computed that. Yes. So this is this Brezan, Guillaume, uh, Guillaume, Justin, 1977. So they use some instanton methods to uh, get this information. Okay. Okay. So, but anyhow, this is uh, this requires a lot of hard work. And then, since I'm giving a talk in Germany, I should mention this very well-known uh, reference for phi four theory by Kleinart and company, which is 539 pages. And they did this heroic calculation in the early 1990s. And this was, I think, uh, pre-email uh, time. So in fact, they had to calculate some 135 diagrams, they say here, and they discovered errors in six of them. And they physically went to Moscow. So hopefully there was no COVID, so they could travel. So they had to physically <laughs> go to Moscow and uh, and then uh, meet up with the Moscow people who had done the cal calculation way earlier, so around 10 years before they had done the calculation. And they confirmed that there were some mistakes in uh, six of these diagrams. and. Uh, they reported this. So you can find uh, all about it in, the, in this massive and very, very informative textbook. It's, it's very nice. You, you learn the state of the art and how things are done, also including the resummation methods. But imagine that you were a graduate student and your supervisor, for whatever sadistic reason, because he's bored sitting at home, told you to compute all these diagrams. And you know, I mean, it, it's a joke. Literally, it's a joke. You can see some some of the diagrams appearing to be cartoons. I mean, this is this reminds me of something uh, from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I mean, this looks like the robot in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So you know, it, it's crazy. So you would this would be a reaction. So this is a conformal screen, <laughs> and this is a conformal screen because you, you're going to say that look, there is conformal invariance to calculate critical exponents. You need to use more symmetries. So Feynman diagrams are great. I mean, you can do a lot of calculations. No, no, no question about it. But for these kind of calculations, it, it has drawbacks, and we have to accept that it has drawbacks. So another major drawback is that you can calculate virtually no OP coefficients. You can calculate indirectly for the stress tensor OP coefficient. So uh, when the stress tensor is exchanged, then you can uh, in the four-point function, then the, there's some indirect way of calculating that. But anyhow. Even if you forget about this drawback, there are still lots of draw diagrams. I just calculated for you the epsilon cube result for delta phi that requires around 10 diagrams to calculate. And I told you that the series is asymptotic. So it, it will stop making sense. So although this is brilliant, you should still ask, okay, but the original goal of all this was, uh, can we understand the three-dimensional Ising model analytically? So analytically might mean many things for different people. So, uh, uh, analytic would mean that you have a formula in terms of some well-studied function. You put whatever values you want in that well-studied function, you get the critical exponent. That could mean an analytic solution. Or it could also mean that can we identify at least in principle the equations that we need to solve to calculate the critical exponents for three dimensions. So we don't have to do this epsilon expansion. Can we at least identify this? So that would be one, one question that you would ask. So I told you that uh, you know this for this, the Feynman diagram is uh, inefficient. You require to you require to think about other things. And the bottom line is it, it's still hard to justify setting epsilon equal to one. You have to do this. Uh, you have to do these resummation methods. You can read Kleinart's book where he discusses resummation methods and so on. And uh, also historically, uh, Heisenberg uh, and Dirac and uh, others were not, they, they were actually un unhappy or uneasy with the quantum field theory framework. So Heisenberg, who started the, or he pioneered uh, the S-matrix theory program, he wanted to do away with the quantum field. So let's see if we can set the equations up differently. So we can use this conformal invariance. So conformal invariance means that there is there are more symmetries. So you, instead of just having Lorentz symmetries, you also have uh, special conformal transformations and dilatations. So if you don't know what these are, don't worry about it. We won't uh, need them, but just remember that there are extra extra symmetry generators, which and extra symmetries are always a good thing for a theorist. And the conformal dimension that I've been using again and again is basically the eigenvalue of this uh, dilatation operator. Um, and uh, when I talk about spin, 
uh, it'll, we will refer to the uh, spin of the symmetric traceless operator entering in the operator product expansion. So I've been using this uh, phrase operator product expansion as well. So I need to explain to you. I will shortly get that in a couple of slides. And making use of this conformal symmetry is basically the job of the conformal bootstrap. And this is an old idea. It originated in the 1970s. And in fact, it was motivated by the S matrix bootstrap, which was an even older idea. And I will review the S matrix bootstrap history as well in a bit. But starting with these equations in the 1970s, whatever people had in the 1970s, very few results, uh, ma people managed to extract very few results. And in fact, uh, the D equal to two was of course solved by the very famous uh, work, BPZ work in the 1980s. But uh, in higher than two dimensions, until this clever numerical paper in 2008, there were hardly any results. So this is, this is the history. So there are, uh, there are so lots of- that numerical paper is the like starting of this journey. Yeah, this is the reincarnation of the, say, yeah. the rebirth of the of the conformal bootstrap side. Yeah. So this is uh, some sp sprinkling of uh, history. So uh, in 1970, Polyakov made the observation that at the critical point you have conformal symmetry. So uh, I think uh, people attribute this observation to him. In 1971, Ferreira. Uh, Gatto and Grillo were the first people to uh, essentially talk about the bootstrap, the conformal bootstrap in some sense that we talk about now. And in 1974, Polyakov wrote this uh, and now pretty influential work uh, called the non-Hamiltonian approach to conformal quantum field theory. There are differences between these two. I will, I will review that in a bit. And uh, but uh, historically, uh, just to remind you, uh, Wilson was doing his epsilon expansion in 1972, around that time. And this was in 1974. So Polyakov was sitting in Russia trying to uh, have this alternative way of doing things. And partly, uh, as far as I understand, it also arises because he belonged to the Landau school and Landau was also uh, a bootstrap sympathizer. And uh, of course, then uh, there was some dormant time until uh, there was this reboot by Ratat Zivichkov, Tony and Vicky in 2008. And there are lots of work, lots of influential papers, lots of uh, insights, um, lots of insights that have been obtained. And this paper has more than 600 citations now. So you can see that uh, from 2008, it has uh, sort of literally taken off. So the philosophy of the conformal bootstrap is that we don't want to talk in terms of a Lagrangian. So there is no such thing as a coupling constant. You can introduce a fake coupling constant, but there is nothing in principle that provides, uh, for, I mean, at least you can write down the equations, the consistency of the conditions. If I told you the phi to the four Lagrangian, then there is a lambda sitting there. So you don't even know what equations to solve to literally uh, get the critical exponents for the three-dimensional IP model. And also for the bootstrap, you don't want to talk in terms of Feynman diagrams. And basically, it turns out that you, there is a way to do it without regularization or solving any RG equations. So you want to make use of this conformal symmetry and talk in terms of the OPE, which is the operator product expansion. The ultimate goal is going to be that you are going to get algebraic equations. You'll, I'm going to show you the algebraic equations that you get. You can literally put them in Mathematica and you can literally get the numbers that, is, that were there in front of each order in epsilon. At least you can do it up to a certain order and just by solving algebraic equations. And you can make each of the steps manifestly finite. You don't have to talk about regularization, no ultraviolet divergences, nothing. So, of course, uh, let's. So let's I have a question. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Tell me. Uh, is that true? In, uh, is it only applicable for strong uh, uh, coupling, or it can be applicable for weak coupling also? And yeah. The bootstrap program. No, uh, so first of all, there is no, uh, there is no a priori, there is no coupling constant as such. You can introduce a fake coupling. Yes. What appears in the bootstrap equation is the dimensionality, space-time dimensionality. So what we are going to do is we're going to directly set D equal to four minus epsilon. And we can pretend that epsilon is small and it can expand. And then you can ask, does it match with the results that Wilson and Fisher had? So you can introduce a small coupling if you wanted to, but it is not necessary. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So just uh, after this uh, sort of kind of intense history dose and uh, setting up the bootstrap philosophy, you must be wondering 
why is it called bootstrap? So if you open the dictionary, you see that bootstrap has a lot of meanings. And of course, uh, some of the meanings are what you would have thought that it literally means something to do with your boot. But uh, basically, uh, this is the meaning that in which the word is used. It is uh, used in the sense that you're relying entirely on your own efforts and resources, or it is self-generating or sustaining. So that's the, that's the word that you use. And uh, historically, again, you know that uh, uh, Wilson had developed his renormalization group program. Polyaga was trying to develop this bootstrap approach. Wilson, in fact, in his uh, Nobel lecture in 1982, um, was summarizing uh, what, what was going on historically. So in the late 1960s, Migdal and Polyakov were developing this bootstrap formalism for critical phenomena. And uh, Wilson was also trying to uh, understand critical phenomena. And uh, they say that, so the, the uh, critical phenomena, the, the bootstrap approach that uh, Wilson talks about here in this line is, a, is different from the uh, bootstrap uh, equation that I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you about. Uh, I don't have time to get into it, but basically it was based on something called skeleton Feynman graph expansion. So there's some Feynman graph machinery still. And they were unable to solve the bootstrap equations because they were quite complex. Uh, and then he says that uh, when the epsilon expansion, when he invented the epsilon expansion, Mac showed that the bootstrap could be solved to lowest order. But he goes on to say, saying that, you know, if he hadn't invented the renormalization group, then the bootstrap approach would have been the most promising framework to understand critical phenomena. However, the renormalization group uh, methods have proved both easier and the bootstrap uh, hence receives very little attention today. This was in 1982. So of course, uh, again, it's, it's nice to figure out whether Polyakov had any retorts to this or not. And uh, this is taken from an interview by Richkov. Uh, in, uh, he, he goes on to say that uh, according to, uh, so this is Polyakov sort of having a time delayed response to uh, what he felt about the renormalization group approach. So he says that, uh, you know, he thinks that there are two types of useful equations. One, of, one, one type is human made. Uh, and the other one is some divine, it has some pre-established harmony. So this is some, so coming from some, I don't know, I mean, something natural, something divine, I guess. And they can be discovered and not invented. So renormalization was invented and it's really a human made thing. It's, it's a smart way of calculating things, but it does not have the breathtaking quality. And he, breathtaking quality of what? He, he feels that the, he doesn't have the breathtaking quality of the operator product expansion. So the operator product expansion actually sets up the bootstrap equations. And then he goes on to say what, how he attempted, and then he says that he still feels that there may be a classification of fixed points in three dimensions, and maybe it's based on string theory, but you know, nobody knows. So what is this OPE? Again, to make sure that everybody is on board. Yes. Uh, before we start this, I have a couple of questions. So mm. uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, in bootstrap program, we don't have coupling constants. Mm. So uh, is it possible to calculate uh, like the Let's say I have an electron, electron, electron positing, uh, positron scattering. Uh, mm. Can I calculate the matrix element here? Because yes. It fundamentally in, in, has, in, uh, in conformal field theory, no, because electrons and you know, uh, things have mass. There's, a, there's an intrinsic scale. But in principle, in the next uh, portion of my talk, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about things where there's a scale, there's a mass in the theory. And in principle, at least you can set up the same equations. Indeed, yeah. Okay, even without having any coupling constants. Yeah, because the coupling constant is ultimately going to get related to some matrix element. So that's how you actually uh, make sense of coupling constants. Coupling constants are fake. I mean, th those are just things that you introduce by hand. I mean, they're not fundamental. But, uh, so you, you actually relate them to some observable, and that's how you uh, make sense of it. Okay, thank you. Okay. So what is this operator product expansion? The operator product expansion is basically some kind of a tailored expansion when you take two operators together, close together. So you have operator at, say you've placed it at the origin and you bring another operator together, then inside any expectation value. So this is an operator equation. So it does not have the expectation value sign. Uh, so this is, this we can use inside, a, inside any correlation function calculation. Can be expanded in this form. So most of it, you can, the, most of the structure that I've written here, so the left-hand side, these are scalar operators. And most of the structure that appears on the right-hand side, you can just fix by, by demanding uh, Lorentz invariance. So that's why you get these, uh, A1 is a Lorentz index. So A1, A2, A3, A, AL are Lorentz indices. So these, these are Lorentz indices. So this tells you about the spin structure of this operator that appears on the right-hand side. 
and then uh, x squared is the Lorentz invariant uh, made of x. It is raised to some specific power. Again, from dimensional analysis, you can fix all these powers. And the coefficient that is sitting in front is the OPE coefficient. So this is the uh, what I had long time back uh, told you that this is what enters into a, a, your three-point function calculation. So in fact, if you wanted to extract this number, you would just put another operator O on both sides and then take the expectation value. So basically, to calculate this OPE coefficient, uh, you would it would get related to a three-point function of phi phi with O. So delta is the conformal dimension, L is the spin. So L basically counts the number of Lorentz indices here. And because this combination is symmetric uh, by, by construction, the Lorentz index structure on this operator O is also symmetric. And in fact, you can also make it symmetric and traceless by pulling out X square factors. So ultimately the bottom line but is that L this- L can be infinity? Sorry? Uh, L can be infinity, yes, 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 yes. So you, this, this continues. Oh, so, oh, so that's why you were saying that it is a convergent. It's uh, infinity also, and uh, the series has to be convergent, I think. The, yeah, so, so this, this is what I've written here, that uh, it has to be a convergent power series expansion. Otherwise, you wouldn't may be able to make sense of it. That's right. Yeah. So very loosely speaking, I've told you what, what it means uh, by saying that it is a convergent power series expansion. You, you know what the radius of convergence is. And it's basically said by the where you're placing uh, the closest operator. Yeah, so, so basically uh, the operator that appears if you have identical scalars is, is basically a symmetric traceless tensor. Uh, and th this object turns out to have even spin. So if you think about four dimensional representation theory, then you can actually relate it with uh, something that has got even spin. So the unknowns, uh, so if you, so of course, if you knew this operator product expansion, then uh, all that you would need to know to use this inside a correlation okay. function. One, one yeah. more question. X yeah. is the insertion point? Sorry? X is the insertion point? No, yeah. no. so uh, uh, you have an operator at the origin and then phi x is where you have placed another operator, the, the second phi. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. So the unknowns in this equation so you, uh, why, why is this a big deal? Because if you knew uh, this uh, operator product expansion, then you can use this recursively because the two point functions are fixed. Two point functions are normalized to one in some, some, some units. So uh, if you could recursively use this operator, operator product expansion, then you could fix your four point function. So that is why it is a big deal. So if you knew these numbers, uh, so the OPE coefficients, these Cs, if you knew the scaling dimension of O and the scaling dimension of phi, and uh, whatever operator appears, the spin of the operator, then, then basically you can recursively use this inside a four point function and uh, have information about uh, the four point correlation function or for that matter of fact, any correlation function. So that's why it's a big deal. Uh, so in that case, uh, we actually, uh, some, uh, I mean, generally we do what? S uh, channel and T channel yes. are equivalent, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Can we do for U channel also? T yes. And I, U and yeah. So if you have identical okay. scalars, then it's the same equation. But if they are non-identical scalars, then in fact you get new information as well for that. And, Indeed. Uh, another 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 question is there uh, that uh, when in 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 case of 3D Ising model, so uh, suppose we consider these spin uh, uh, correlation functions, I mean, uh, the sigma sigma. Yes. In that case, suppose uh, in critical point, though, we know that, that the correlation length will uh, yes. be infinite. Yeah. Right. So yes. in that case, the channel uh, somehow uh, is equal to one, one over this uh, model x1 minus x2. Right? That's right. So yeah. why it is so, why they, uh, is that for any case of uh, the massless fermions or uh, that I could not. I mean, that's, that happens at, at criticality. Yeah, so that, that happens at criticality. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's a property of criticality. Uh, sometimes it goes to some power also. I mean, uh, this one over this mod of that factor over the yes. some power also. Yes, that's uh, because. I cannot, uh, yeah, so that's because. Sometimes, uh, so another question is there. 
actually no, so for maybe, maybe what you are asking low temperature actually yeah, so for low temperature it is going to the exponential when for low temperature it is going some one over this factor why it is so that is my question actually. yeah so uh, that that of course is because you are at different temperatures but at the critical point it it actually goes uh, uh, the way that it behaves is fixed by conformal invariance so we are talking about a theory that is at the critical point so we are not away from the critical point so uh, so this is at, literally at the critical temperature so at tc no at tc somehow uh, sometimes it goes to the exponential and uh, for massless uh, or gapless it goes to some one over uh, so if, if it is conformal invariance it will go like this power law the, the that point function of, uh, yeah yeah but if if there is conformal invariance then it it has to go like a power law so this follows from conformal symmetries so basically the idea is that you have to ma make sure that your correlation function respects the conformal ward identities so when you solve the conformal ward identities you will you will find that it has to go like a power law so this is a property at, at the fixed point because it has inherent symmetry yeah. Yeah? okay thank you sir yeah so this is how you set up the boot, the, the bootstrap equation so uh, as somebody was saying that uh, you know you, the bootstrap equation is basically a consistency condition why is it a consistency condition because suppose you are calculating a four point function so why do we start with a four point function because conformal invariance fixes for you the two point function and the three point functions up to some number the, the three point function is also fixed up to some number so then the dynamical input actually starts from the four point function so inside the four point function you can do the operator product expansion basically it means that you have to take two operators and bring them close together uh, so you can do it in different ways so you can bring these two operators close together so one and two close together so that this is what it means so this is not a fine man diagram this is just a cartoon to say that we are we are bringing one and two close together and then that is why it's exchanging this operator o so basically we are bringing these two operators and uh, using the operator product expansion that i showed in the, showed in the previous slide and you can bring three and four close together. Uh, and then um, basically because of the fact that the two point function is normalized, it has to be the same operator. You can write, you can draw a diagram like this. Uh, okay, so you can do it in two different ways. So either you can do it by bringing these two close together or you can change the ordering. These are bosonic operators. There is no time ordering. I'm talking about Euclidean correlation function. So I can push things through and I can bring one and four close together. So that gives us two different channels. So one of them is called the S channel or the direct channel and the other one is called the T channel or the cross channel. You can do it in one or the other way as well by bringing one and three close together that gives you the U channel. Uh, but if uh, we are talking about the four point function of identical scalars, then uh, just solving this is equivalent to solving uh, the other condition as well. So you get S equal to T or S equal to U. Uh, but uh, because this is identical scalar, S equal to U is automatically satisfied. And it's easy to see uh, because you can exchange four and three and you, you don't don't uh, lose anything because they're identical. So this is basically the bootstrap equation. So the thing to remember about the bootstrap equation is that you have, you are expanding, you know, what are you expanding in? So you're expanding basically in, in terms of some functions which uh, have information about this operator. So remember that this operator had two quantum numbers. So it has this quantum number, the scaling dimension or the conformal dimension of that operator and the spin. So the function with, with respect to which you are expanding should also have the same information. It, it, it should be a function of that conformal dimension of O and the spin. And the, these functions are called uh, conformal, uh, conformal partial waves or conformal blocks. I mean, there's a distinction between the two, but uh, uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'll, I'll use them interchangeably. So when you write down this equation, so there are these x1, x2, x3, and x4, these are positions, you can define uh, something called uh, cross ratios, conformal cross ratios. And this is very specific. You can do this only because you have conformal symmetry. And this is a useful exercise to do. You can actually show that these are invariant under all, uh, all the symmetries, not just the Lorentz symmetries and scale, uh, Lorentz symmetries, but also the, the scale symmetry and the special conformal symmetries. So these are two special uh, special ratios u and v conventionally they are called u and v uh, and uh, 
the, this four point function. And so there are two variables. I mean, you can write it in terms of Z and Z bar as well. It's some change of variables that you can do. This is some convenient change of variables. Things sometimes simplify if you do this change of variables, but it is not very critical for, 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 our, for our purpose. The four point function actually becomes uh, a function of U and V up to some uh, well-known uh, overall factor. So you can just factor it out and define a reduced amplitude, which is this curly A, which is just a function of two variables, U and V. And the crossing equation, so this is this S equal to T condition, can be simply rewritten in terms of, uh, in terms of this uh, curly A. And so to frame this condition, I did not, of course, specify any theory. I just uh, use the symmetries. And it's a non-trivial condition because this is a function of u and v, and it gets non-trivially related to the same function with u and v interchanged. So this is actually u and v interchanged multiplied by this uh, non-trivial fact. This is some exercise that you can do uh, yourself. You can start off with this, and then you can interchange two and four because the equation that I wrote here was two and four interchanged. So when you do that, you can uh, write down this equation. It's a good exercise to those who are getting into bootstrap to derive this. Hello, I have a question. Like yes. in case of uh, Lorentzian uh, CFT, like uh, this crossing equation, like the interchange of one and three, the way you are saying, like will that uh, be accepted? Yeah. So that will there be is a time bit more subtle. Input? Yes, that will be more subtle because you have to take care of uh, time order in there. This exchange, uh, you have to make, you have to make sure that it is allowed. Okay, okay. So, so that will assume some kind of analyticity property or something yes. like Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. In fact, uh, you can, by thinking in terms of uh, the Lorenzian correlators, you can get uh, more mileage as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, so how do you go about solving this? I mean, this has a lot of uh, information, although it may not seem like it. I mean, it seems like you can do. Uh, it's very hard to get anything out of it. But can we solve this numerically? That that would be the first first goal because obviously it's very complicated. Uh, in principle, this is an uncountably infinite number of equations because this is supposed to be true for any point u and v. Uh, okay, so the reason why you can do uh, you can solve this numerically is because of a property of the of the of the conformal blocks. So this equation you can. Uh, uh, rewrite so you can expand in terms of these conformal partial waves that I told you about, and you can sort of rewrite in a sort of different way, algebraically different way. You can rewrite the same equation in this manner. So here, these f's are the conformal partial waves. I'm doing an expansion. It's the same equation. So it's the same equation, and you can ask what is the property of these conformal partial waves. So in writing this equation, you really don't know what delta is. You do also don't know what what are the uh, spins that are allowed in this theory. In principle, it could be that you know you get a consistency condition by just having uh, a single scalar in the theory. Maybe you don't require to put in any spin. Only that maybe the maybe you can ask this question that can you have a conformal field theory without any spins? I mean, it seems a little strange, but uh, in principle you can ask. You also don't know what the dimension of the operators are. So can you get any constraint from this uh, at all? So for this, first thing to first thing to uh, notice that this C delta L that I've written is basically the operator product expansion square. That is because in I have used the OP twice. So the OP coefficient comes twice. So it's OP square. And for, uh, for unitary theories, OP square is positive. For non-unitary theories, it can be negative. But for unitary theories, it is positive. So this number here is positive. Now you can actually ask, what is the property of this uh, F delta L. You can plot a graph. You can plot a graph by doing this diagonal limit. And uh, so I've said Z equal to Z bar and if I've plotted a graph. Uh, so you can do it for higher spins. All higher spins have the same kind of behavior that at the midpoint, it has a minimum. The scalar, on the other hand, has a very interesting feature. The scalar is, uh, has, a, has a change in behavior. So if your scalar was very large, if the dimension of the scalar was very large, then it will have a minimum. So this is uh, this purple graph is uh, when the dimension of the scalar is large. But if it is not too large, but still compatible with unitarity, there is something called the unitarity bound. So you have to be above that for your theory to be unitary. Then you can show that it has a maximum. 
Now, in order to solve this equation, so you're looking at what is happening at the midpoint. So basically, you're looking at the second derivative of this equation because the second derivative is fixed by whether it's a maximum or a minimum. So second derivative is going to get rid of this one, and then you're left with whatever is happening to these blocks on the right-hand side. So this is telling you that unless and until you have at least one scalar in your theory whose dimension is below a certain critical dimension, you will not be able to solve this equation. So that is basically the key observation that enables you to uh, get some mileage, to get some bounds uh, from these bootstrap conditions. And you can do this uh, quite sophistically. Uh, the way that I've described it, these are the kind of things that you can easily do on Mathematica, but in order to get really non-trivial bounds, you have to develop this idea a bit more. But basically, this is the key idea. By developing this key idea, you get various kinds of bounds. So you can, uh, so here you can plot the uh, plot the leading scalar. So this is the scalar that you must have in the theory versus the external scalar. So this is the fundamental scalar that you're considering the correlation function of. And you can plot what are the allowed dimensions for this leading scalar operator in the operator product expansion. And it turns out that not anything is allowed. In fact, you're, say, suppose you're talk, talking about the Ising model, then any, uh, any delta S that is here is disallowed. And you're, you can only have delta S that is in this region below this line. So this is the Ising line. So that is observation one. And the other observation is that it has an in interesting feature. So each of these graphs, so you can do it for global symmetry. So this, so these are theories with have, which have more than one scalar. So this is for one scalar. This is for uh, more than one scalar. But each of these graphs actually has a kink. It has a bend. And uh, it turns out uh, from observation, you can observe it, observe the values of this, of this scaling dimension so and this scaling dimension. The error bars dimension. are coming from the experiments? No. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. These, these are coming from Monte Carlo. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. And uh, interesting theories. So, for example, the Ising model. The Ising model, with, which has this very specific yeah, dimension. Uh, sorry, sorry. One more yeah. uh, question. So, why particularly this kink appears? Ah, so that is uh, kind of in, in, kind of vaguely understood. So, uh, vaguely un why why am I using the words vague? Because uh, the reason why this kink kink appears is because of some some decoupling of operators at this point. So, it's something like in two dimensions. It's it's something like the uh, like the uh, the non-state conditions, it's not quite that. Basically, uh, why I use the words that this is not completely understood is because we don't know how to write down the equation at the kink. If we knew what the equation that the king king solves, this would be one way of solving it analytically. What happens for n equal infinity? Ah, good question. I'm not sure. I mean, you can extrapolate this. Uh, I think this king gets pushed further and further back. So as you can see, this kink moves along this graph. Uh, so I think it moves more towards uh, the left-hand side. So maybe it, it comes to one, I, I'm not sure. I, I believe it comes to, comes to 0. 0.5 and two. But good question. Thank you. And what this uh, bending line represents? This line, this is, uh, uh, I, uh, this is kind of following the kink. What is how the kink is moving towards as you keep increasing n? Okay. Okay. Now this was uh, the mileage that you get from considering a single correlator. But remember that uh, you already know that there are other operators in the theory. So, for example, you already know that there is this extra scalar operator that is there in the theory. So you could try to bootstrap by putting this extra scalar back. And you can try to consider a correlation function that has got this scalar and phi, uh, or this scalar, four of these scalars, and so on. And you can consider multiple correlators. And this multiple correlators will give you even more constraints. Basically, it turns out that you start getting islands, which are not uh, very large, they're reasonably small. And one un unanswered question from the numerical point of view is that uh, do these islands shrink to a point? So this is still not known. Some people say they expect it to shrink to a point, but it's not known. Excuse me. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Uh, can yeah. you repeat again what is the significance of this kink? I mean, you said all this area below that line is, is allowed in principle. 
Yes. So why they think is important. So, so if you look at the values, so the first observation that people made was if you look at the values of the operators at this king. So this one, if you read it off from the x-axis, this is 5.16, uh, sorry, 0 0.516, 0 0.517, 0 0.518. So the, the, this operator, this uh, delta phi has dimensions 0.518, and if you remember, 0.518 was the dimension that we got from Monte Carlo. And if you look at what is happening to the dimension of delta s, this also works out to be. It's not very easy to. Uh, see this, but then this also works out to be uh, close to what you, uh, what you would have expected from the Monte Carlo simulation. So the Ising model appears to live, live at the kink. I see. Okay. So that's, that's, then it gives you a conjecture that the other theories also live at the kink. That's right. Yeah. So interesting physical theories probably live at, live at the kink. So the way to make this more precise is to, of course, consider multiple correlators, and that's what these people have done. And when you consider multiple correlators, instead of having the single line, you start seeing islands. And for the Ising, it's, it's a very, very small region. So yeah. At this, I have one more question. Mm. So particularly at the key, you said that the analytical solution you don't know. In so both, an, analytical yeah. solution in the sense that we don't know what equations give, uh, what are the equations that we write down for the king? Okay, okay. But Say in this space, in the space of delta S and delta phi. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So you can do this in fractional dimensions as well. So remember that uh, what we started off, and I'm doing extremely badly with time, but nonetheless. Uh, so we started off by uh, reviewing the epsilon expansion. And you can do bootstrapping arbitrary dimensions because d is a parameter in the theory. And you can set d equal to 4 minus epsilon or whatever you want. And you can redo the numerics. So this 2 is for two dimensions. 2.25 is in 2.25 dimensions and so on. And as you can see, for each of these cases, you always get a kink, and uh, and the dimension of these operators uh, at the kink are what you would expect from the epsilon expansion. Okay, so numerics they have made a lot of progress. The state of the art uses what is called semi-definite programming. There are online packages, for example, and there are multiple online packages, uh, well-known packages. One by Simmons Duff, and it's called semi-definite programming for Bootstrap. Uh, to run these, you require powerful class computing clusters, and these computing clusters have many, many cores. So the state of the art is something that has got close to 49,000 cores. And it's called the Comet cluster, which is uh, in the University of California, San Diego. Um, and uh, you, you, you tend to feel, as a theorist, you tend to feel a bit unsatisfied because it seems like you're putting in a lot of computing power and basically, uh, you, you would ask whether whether we, whether one can hope to solve the 3D Ising model, at least in the sense that these people have done on a laptop. But for that, uh, alternative techniques are being developed as we speak. Uh, they've been developed for the, over the last couple of years by Dalimil and Miguel uh, and others. I mean, there, there's been a lot of follow-up work after that as well. And this is called analytic or optimal functionals. And it's a promising technique. Uh, we have to see how it goes. Uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it, it has not, uh, I mean, at least I have not seen any papers which actually reproduces all these results, uh, uh, but the claim is that they, they should be able to. Okay. Now, can we do beyond numerics? Can we do things analytically? And this is where uh, the main part of my conformal bootstrap side of the story uh, talk begins. So can we uh, reproduce this epsilon expansion, for example? And uh, it is actually difficult to study those equations that I showed you analytically. Uh, you have to develop clever techniques, and uh, uh, the cleverest that uh, exists is this large spin approximation that has been developed by uh, quite a few people, but mainly by Fernando Alday and collaborators. But ultimately, even if you do manage to do this, you have to do some resummation. And there is a big drawback, and this is, I think, a challenge. So anybody who wants to work on the analytic side of the bootstrap, this is the, my challenge for uh, anybody who claims to have found a technique, analytic technique. You calculate for me the phi square anomalous dimension. And this phi square, which is the leading scalar anomalous dimension in the epsilon expansion, is very hard to explain uh, for any of these methods. So let me just uh, tell you about this new approach. Um, this new approach is something that uh, we have been developing over the last uh, several years with my students and uh, my collaborator, Rajesh Gopakumar, uh, at the ICTS. So Kalol was my graduate student. A. Kaviraj is Apratim Kaviraj. He is uh, uh, 
is a postdoc with uh, Slava Richkov in, in Paris. Kolosen, who's a, he's an, right now a postdoc in Trinity College Dublin, and Parijat is also there. Uh, Parijat is a postdoc in Uppsala. And uh, some of my existing graduate students, this is Koshik Ghosh and this is Ahmadullah Zahid. And Pietro Ferrero is a uh, Fernando Aldai student in uh, Oxford. So we've been developing it over the last several years and I'll tell you what the story is. Uh, but why particularly Melin space? I will, I will, I will tell you that, yes. Yeah, all, that, uh, all, that, all those are good questions. Okay. So this is uh, partly or partly motivated by the 1974 seminal paper by Polyakov. So in the histor history slide, I showed you three people. One of them was Polyakov uh, claiming that uh, the, the, the critical point has conformal symmetry. The other one was Ferrara Gattu Grillo, Grillo. And then the third paper was this 1974 paper. So I'm going to explain to you what he did in this 1974 paper. But I'm going to use modern terminology. So I'm going to re-express his equations in modern terminology. And that is where Melin space is going to come in. So basically, in a very concrete sense, in which I'm going to explain to you, Polyakov was the first person to ever calculate a Witten diagram. So those people who know about holography, the ADS CFT correspondence, will know that Witten diagrams are basically scattering amplitudes in ADS space. And these Witten, Witten diagrams in ADS space, so whenever you have a circle and you see a Feynman diagram inside it, this is a Witten diagram. The circle uh, basically signifies that ADS is like a box. And this is the boundary of ADS. This is where the conformal field theory lives, so to speak. And uh, this is what is happening in the bulk. So somehow, somehow this is the bulk, which is a one higher dimensional space. And this is the boundary and so on. So this is the S-channel Wheaton diagram. These are all tree level exchange Wheaton diagrams. This is, uh, and so on. And I should emphasize that the modern interpretation is that the, these are convenient kinematical bases. So you should not think that we are postulating an ADS-CFT dual to the epsilon expansion or to the wilson fisher fixed point. We're just going to use these, this as a convenient basis. Uh, and we are just going to postulate that we are allowed to do that and see how far we go. So, uh, as I said, that these are building blocks of the ADA-CFT correspondence, and this was postulated in 1997, whereas Polyakov's paper was in 1974. Um, so, the bootstrap approach, the traditional approach, so what is the difference between what Polyakov proposed in 1974 and whatever we have been reviewing so far? So, what led to the numerics? So in the traditional approach, you have this equation, which is the direct channel equal to the cross channel. So you have some, con uh, some compatible partial wave basis. Uh, so you know this partial wave, they are the conformal partial waves. They solve a conformal Casimir differential equation. So you actually know them explicitly. So you solve this equation. So basically you have something that is uh, compatible with the operator product expansion, but you're imposing crossing. Polyakov's approach was to swap this order. So he wanted to use a crossing symmetric basis, which, which are like these exchange diagrams. So whenever you have a field theory, you have something that has got an inverted basis if you, if you calculate Feynman diagrams. But you then, you stand, the, you, you, you stand the chance of losing consistency with the OP. And I will explain to you what this actually means. So you swap this uh, order in which you do things. So now you have this basis and uh, you have to sum over all these operators. And as I said, it has got inbuilt crossing symmetry. So let me just go through a little bit about the technical details so, so that you don't feel that I'm just blabbering on without doing any calculations. Um, so how did Polyakov know about Wheaton diagrams in 1974? So this is where Mellin transform comes in. So th this is how you define a Mellin transform. Uh, I believe it's, um, yeah, somebody told me that th there's a different way of pronouncing Melin, but let me, yeah. Um, and uh, so let me explain to you what we're going to do. So we're going to take this correlation function. I told you that there is this function of u and v, which conformal symmetry gives us, the function of u and v. And you do the Melin transform. It's a two-variable Melin transform. So you do exactly this, but for both variables, u and v. And there is some convenient factor. This convenient factor actually turns out to be quite important from the ADS CFT perspective. But for now, you can think of it as some convenient factor that we pull out. And this is the Mellin transform, this M of ST. This is what is called Mellin amplitude uh, in some sense, which I will not have time to explain. Uh, this is analogous to flat space scattering amplitude. And these, this SNT, although these are Mellin variables, you can mentally think of them as the Mandelstam SNT variables. 
So how did uh, Wheaton, uh, how did Polyakov calculate this Wheaton diagram? So again, I'm presenting it in modern day language. So in modern day, if you want, wanted to calculate, say, an exchange Wheaton diagram, so this is an exchange, so this is an exchange scalar for convenience, external operators are all scalars, you would land up getting an expression uh, which involves a generalized hypergeometric function. Uh, this is called a 3F2 hypergeometric function. So those of you who wanted to know a bit more mathematical detail, just hold on, I'll tell you what this 3F2 function is. And this was uh, shown uh, essentially by Mac and Penedonis and Paulos. Uh, so Mac was the first person to realize, and uh, this was, he started this in uh, late 2000s, maybe 2008 or 2009, when he realized that uh, Mellon space is the natural space to write down correlation functions for a conformal field theory. And then it was uh, built on by Joao and Miguel. Uh, and then th there's a lot of work on this Mellon space uh, after that. But of course, uh, Polyakov wouldn't have known this. Rather, what Polyakov did is in this direction. So Polyakov, for whatever reason, uh, you have to go through the paper to find out the reason, was able to write down uh, this amplitude in terms of a spectral function. And he managed to argue what the form of the spectral function should be. So basically, he wanted to demand good convergence properties of the spectral function. So he managed to write down the spectral function. And it turns out to be exactly, if you went, went ahead with the calculation, exactly the same as what would give rise to this 3F2 function. It's quite remarkable. So in fact, he, if you go through this paper, work things out, you'll, you'll see that literally you, you will reach here. Now, uh, just a mathematical prelude in case you don't know what a hypergeometric function uh, is. Uh, sorry, yeah. one question in the previous slide. So yes. what, what H corresponds to here? H is d by two, so it, uh, spaced uh, the uh, dimensionality of the conformal field theory, but divided by two. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. Yes, okay. S is the many variable. Uh, Delta phi uh, is uh, the. Other yeah. things are okay. okay. And the, is there is it is the, the like something to do with the Mellin transformation? That's why this particular hypergeometric function appears. Um, I mean, you, uh, it yes. I mean, it turns out that if you. Uh, went ahead with the calculation in Mellon space. So you can write down the propagators in Mellon space and so on. Uh, if you did this in Mellon space, then you would, you would get this quite naturally. Okay. The 3F2 function, yes. I mean, if you want to uh, know the technical details, I would recommend starting with Miguel's paper. Uh, it has got more details than Joao's paper does, but uh, yeah, you could start there. Hey, Aninda? Yes. How much of this is fixed by the symmetries? So, in other words, Polyakov wrote in '74 this answer you write there with yes. that. That probably how how he fixed that Q based on symmetries or how much of this is fixed. Ah, that's an excellent question. So the way that Polyakov fixed it is that he observed that so there are these double pole factors. This gamma square is a double pole factor. Okay, these double poles are very important because they translate into this factor that I've pulled out here, and this this turns out to be the double trace operators that you actually do not sum over when you're writing down, you, you only sum over single trace operators in the ADS safety language. And when you're talking about uh, the, the, the scat, uh, this uh, Mellon amplitude. So Polyakov of course did not know all this, but then he knew that he need, needed to have better convergence properties in terms of new. So one way of improving convergence properties is to introduce poles. And he had an argument to say that you need to introduce these double poles to improve the convergence properties of the spectral function. So, if you did not have these double poles, you'll have bad convergence properties. And that's what he, he argued. You could say that, okay, but why are you introducing the double poles through a gamma square factor? You could introduce the double poles some other way. I think uh, he chose a gamma function out of convenience and then it turns out to be a very big coincidence that it gives rise to the same thing. Now I will give you, uh, in, in, in a couple of slides, I will explain to you how to go from the original uh, formula in terms of the conformal partial release to this form. So I think quite a bit of it is fixed by symmetries up to some regular functions. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Yeah. I was failing to touch the unmute, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have one more question. Yeah. Yes. So since you were saying that the, whatever inside happening you are considering to be uh, like in the bulk ADS, so suppose uh, I'm trying to understand from another perspective, which is people presently using 
D D S. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh, so in yes. D S, people used to con construct things in terms of momentum space. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So. So uh, like uh, even like I know that. Yeah, so people have, people have done people have yeah. done uh, Mellon space uh, versions of the, yeah. of the of the D theta correlation correlation. Oh, yeah, in fact, yeah. in fact, Charlotte slide and also yeah, uh, yeah. Costa Skender is uh, is also somebody who will be working on related things. Okay, so just uh, for the students there, the hypergeometric functions, there's nothing to get scared about. They are extremely well studied. There are inbuilt functions in Mathematica. A lot is known about these, uh, these, these functions. And the only thing you should be aware of is that Mathematica does not have a natural way of simplifying. So if you gave Mathematica a product, uh, maybe a 3F2 at unit argument, Mathematica is not going to simplify it. But then there are these clever formulas. There's something called the Schall-Schutz summation formula which can actually simplify that uh, 3F2. So that is where you have to go and consult the literature. So everything, you cannot rely on Mathematica. So the hypergeometric function, the 3F2, uh, so I had three arguments on top. So this is one, this is two, this is three, and two arguments in the denominator, one and two. And then there was a fourth argument. So basically there are six, uh, so six entries. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six. And so these are the things that I've written on top in that formula. And then these are things that I've written on, in the bottom. And they are uh, some infinite series. It's very well understood in finite series. So basically, uh, there are these are called Pokhama symbols. The Pokhama symbols are defined as ratios of gamma functions here. So there are, depending on how many of them are there in the numerator and how many are uh, there in the denominator, you'll have as many Pokhama symbols. So 3F2 means that there'll be three Pokhamas in the numerator and two Pokhamas in the denominator. There's always this n factorial and then x to the n. And the sum runs from zero to infinity. These are extremely well understood functions. A lot is known. These are single variable hypergeometric functions. People also talk about multivariable hypergeometric functions. And uh, multiple variable hypergeometric functions are less well understood. So you, you would have encountered hypergeometric functions without knowing it, even if you uh, have never encountered hypergeometric functions before. So for example, the genre polynomials are a special example of this Gauss hypergeometric function. This 2F1 is called a Gauss, Gauss hypergeometric function. Is the most famous hypergeometric function. And these Legendre polynomials are some limit of some truncating 3F2 as well. So a lot is known uh, about these hypergeometric functions. If you have a polynomial also, there is a lot that is known in terms of uh, polynomials. So basically, why is that important? It's important because it allows you to, you to generalize. So for instance, if you wanted to calculate, say, something that only deviates a little bit away from flat space, uh, the, the natural thing to do would be to try and locate some deformations of the Lagrange polynomials. Uh, so I told you that I'm going to tell you very quickly uh, how you go from the usual conformal partial wave form to the, the this 3F2 Wheaton diagram form. So let me just tell you. So you can you have a have a conformal partial wave. It satisfies some uh, Casimir differential equation. You know the solution. You can take the Mellin transform of this. So this was done by Dolan and Osborne. Uh, so whatever I write, I'm writing here, I'm using the same conventions that Dolan and Osborne used in the 2011 paper, which is a very nice paper. And you will see that uh, they, they, they get what is what are called the, these MAC polynomials. So the, these are some polynomials, well understood polynomials, but well understood in some very, so, so you know the exp explicit examples. You don't know the orthogonality properties of these polynomials. You know something about various limits of these polynomials, but not much as much as is known. But this is the usual conformal partial wave. So you have these bunch of gamma functions. Uh, there is a tilde here. So this tilde actually means that when you are closing the contour, you don't pick up the poles of this because these turn out to be what are called shadow poles. These are uh, unphysical poles. But basically, uh, you can write it, write them down quite explicitly. Uh, it's it's a product of two gamma functions divided by this gamma square. And this gamma square is also kind of important because uh, this gamma square gets rid of the poles, these double poles that comes from this gamma square factor. So, uh, so basically, you don't have any zeros. Uh, so, sorry, you don't have any double poles uh, that you would have not ordinarily come if you had this uh, just this gamma square factor. Gamma square usually has poles. So gamma has a pole. So gamma square has a double pole. Okay. Now, so what do we have? So we have a Wheaton diagram, which is a 3F2, and we have the conformal block, which is just this ratio of gamma functions. And they don't look like each other. So what's going on? So is there a way of going from this form to that form? Let me just quickly tell you how to do, do that. It is indeed possible, and this is some trick. 
that you can pick up because if you're fond of, uh, I mean, if you, knew, if, you, if you knew about the old string theory literature, then there is a very famous property that they use. Uh, this is called the Euler beta function. So this is a product of gamma functions divided by gamma squared. You can write it as an Euler beta function uh, times gamma functions. And the property of the Euler beta function is that you can expand this Euler beta function only in terms of the poles. And you know the exact ex expansion. You, and that property is not available for the usual gamma function. The gamma function has a pole uh, for negative integers, but you cannot write the gamma function as sum over the residues of those at those poles. There's a regular piece that you will you will miss. But if you have the Euler beta function, uh, you can write it without that regular piece. So you can literally write this in terms of some expansion, and then you can further tailor expand around the pole. So this is where the where the where the physical operators would live, and you can expand that. That is how you get this. Is this regular piece that I've written here comes from Taylor expanding uh, this exact formula, uh, not from the regular piece of the gamma function. And if you just plug this into Mathematica, you'll you'll recover exactly this 3F2 form. So for a scalar, you literally get this 3F2, which I uh, which was known from the Eichen diagram calculations. Okay, and uh, this uh, I don't know if anybody knows who this gentleman here is, but this is uh, Mittag Leffler. So Mittag Leffler has a very famous theorem in complex analysis. I don't want to get into this, but basically, if you are given just the residues and the poles to write down a function which has the properties of a function, you would uh, require to do uh, an analysis along the lines of Mittag Leffler. This is not always possible. Roughly speaking, uh, you can think of it this way. So this is the S channel conformal block. So this is literally what Dolan and Osborne have. You can write it in terms of the Wheaton diagram. So this is the exchange Wheaton diagram times some zeros. So this is this function has zeros at very specific values of S. So you can see that if you set S equal to delta phi, this vanishes. S equal to delta phi plus one, it vanishes and so on. Whenever you have zeros, that means that you have something that looks like S minus S naught times S minus S one times S minus S two and so on. But S naught and S one, S two, S are the locations of the zeros. But that means that it has bad behavior at large s. And this is precisely what gives you a bad behavior at uh, large real s. And our modern interpretation of Polyakov's observation is that it is better, best not to have this factor if you want good convergence properties in s, in complex s. If you want to think in terms of, uh, things of think of this m as an amplitude. You want to have, you want, any amplitude should have nice convergence properties so that you can actually close the arc at infinity and write down some dispersion relations and so on. So now that you've thrown this away, what you've done is you've introduced spurious poles. These spurious poles come because basically you've gotten rid of the zero. You've gotten rid of the zero, so you've introduced these poles. These poles would tell you that there are operators of literally dimension two delta phi, two delta phi plus two, two delta phi plus four, and so on. And in any consistent conformal field theory, you don't expect these operators to be present typically, unless until there's some symmetry that protects them. You expect these operators to have anomalous dimensions. It's not two delta phi plus, it's two delta phi plus gamma, two delta phi plus two plus gamma and so on. But you don't literally have these operators. So that's why I call them spurious operators. So the hope would be that you start off with the usual conformal wave expansion. You do this uh, thing of throwing away this uh, factor but you've lost uh, this convergence property. Uh, so sorry, you've, you've lost this uh, consistency with OPE. And the only hope is to recover the consistency by adding crossing symmetry. So to summarize, what we have done is we started off with something that was had, the, had nice properties so far as the OPE is concerned. We got rid of some factors which introduced spurious poles coming from this gamma squared factor. And then by hand, we added the T and U channels. Why did we add this T and U channels? Because hopefully with this, we can recover consistency by, by uh, demanding that these spurious poles cancel. If we did not add these T and U channels, we would have these spurious poles and there would be no way that we would be able to cancel them. This rho C here is a potential contact term. This actually means that they are polynomials in S and T. So S, T and U would have poles in S, T and U but uh, this does not have any poles. So these are regular terms. So now you look at each channel separately, you will find that there are these spurious powers in position space. So you don't expect these powers and they, this would be incompatible with this channel OPE. So these are generally spurious and you expect them to cancel. So that's how you get consistency conditions. 
So originally in the usual approach, you got consistency condition by demanding that it satisfied crossing. Here we are saying that spurious poles should cancel and that's how you get consistency conditions. So basically this is the structure of the equation that you get. So you get a lot of information. So in, 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 in this perturbative language where we are trying to reproduce phi, phi four, the, uh, the Wilson Fisher theory, by looking at various uh, different equations, you recover, and this is the beauty of this approach, you re start recovering information about basically uh, up to at least some order, one operator at a time. So this is typically not the feature that the ordinary bootstrap equations have. Typically the feature is that there is one operator on one side and you require an infinite number of operators on the other side to reproduce that contribution in the cross channel. And that is where you lose the, uh, I mean, that is why it becomes com complicated. So demanding this consistency condition, uh, which I uh, briefly uh, told you about, you can recover whatever Wilson and Cobert uh, had. And in addition, you also get OP results. So OP results come from come for free because OP is something that is sitting inside the, uh, inside the equations. So this is what you would literally do. You, 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 you would look at this consistency condition, you make an ansatz for delta phi, ansatz for delta phi square, ansatz for delta phi to the four and so on. And also make an ansatz for OP. Uh, epsilon is just D, uh, the, this four minus epsilon, that epsilon that is sitting there. So you set D equal to four minus epsilon and then you expand. And you get algebraic equations. These are the kind of equations that you would get. You literally put them in mathematically, you solve them and you recover whatever Wilson and Kugert had, had produced in addition to these OP coefficients. So these are just literally algebraic equations. And you can compare with known numerics. So, so uh, you can go to Simmons Duffin's paper and see how does the epsilon expansion compare with uh, numerics? It's reasonable. You can get these OP coefficients. OP coefficients are new, as I told you. So these, these are known results. These are three loop Feynman diagram calculation results. Uh, and uh, using this algebraic approach, you uh, reproduce exactly this result. This is new. So the OP coefficient, as I told you, is new. You cannot calculate it using Feynman diagrams. So you can calculate this and you can compare it with numerics. You can see that the epsilon cube result, which we had computed, improves the numerics a little bit, and then epsilon to the four improves it even more, and so on. Um, and as I told you, that there's this indirect argument to calculate the stress tensor OP. Uh, it's, it was known till second order. So this five epsilon squared by three twenty four, this was already known. This was a new result. This epsilon cube result via this approach. And this was uh, done by Alde and company, but using this large spin perturbation theory, not, not using this approach. You can do other things as well. It, it gives you good agreement. And there's also rich mathematics that is, uh, that is there. The, depending on how mathematically minded you are, the building blocks of these equations are what are called seven F six hypergeometric functions. Now, this may or may not mean something to you, but if you know something about hypergeometric functions, these 7 f 6 hypergeometric functions are the generalized 6J symbols for non compact groups. So this is known in the mathematics literature, but it's uh, not that well explored in, uh, in the physics community as yet. And uh, I'm quite confident that uh, this is going to have a more of a role to play. Now, is all well. So can you do this to arbitrary orders? Can you uh, potentially solve it by setting epsilon equal to one? And uh, unfortunately, the answer is no. The answer is no, is it's because the basis that I exhibited were, were, had only the exchange diagrams. But if you know uh, about scattering in EDS, there are also contact diagrams. And we didn't add them. So are they needed? These polynomial pieces, this row C, I told you that you need to add this polynomial piece. Are these needed or what role do these play? So the story uh, is the following that for one dimensional CFT, so these are like uh, quantum mechanical theories, you know convincingly that you need to have these contact terms and you, these can be fixed as well. So this was done first done by Mazak and Paulos uh, a couple of years back. And in recently with uh, Pietro, Koshik and Ahmadullah, we gave a different argument, which actually also fixes the contact terms and equal to one. Now, somewhat surprisingly, this contact term does not affect any of the results up to epsilon square. So whatever result we had found for a phi square was correct up to epsilon square. It will affect at epsilon cubed order, 
it will change the result as epsilon q and uh, this is an unsolved problem so far so we we are still developing this story so the immediate future so far as this program is concerned is that there's a version and in fact as uh, as i'm talking penedonis is giving a strings talk in the strings conference uh, on a non perturbative formulation of this polyakov conditions and they use uh, a somewhat different starting point they they use a, a, a dispersion relation approach and this is a not not a crossing symmetric approach so this is different from polyakov starting point and they but they land up with a version of the polyakov conditions now they have not studied it uh, very thoroughly as yet in, in in particular the epsilon expansion has not been investigated using this approach but it is a promising direction uh, but a challenge in that approach and any other approach is to get the epsilon square epsilon expansion for the scalar scalar operator phi square to work so that would be a challenge for that approach and as uh, one of you asked shantan asked that uh, can you do this in momentum space uh, the momentum space version is being developed by a lot of people uh, including costas and collaborators and just to point out 19 the 1974 paper of polyakov had two parts essentially so in one part he was just following momentum space approach he was writing down momentum space dispersion relations and uh, i know for a fact but because, because this is some check that i did with my student kalol that his momentum space answer he did not give this answer in his paper so he just had the leading other answer his momentum space answer not only reproduces epsilon square but also reproduces the rational part of the three loop for phi square and i believe that this cannot be a coincidence i think his momentum space does have certain features which are definitely uh, correct and uh, it will be worth trying to connect this up okay so uh, i wanted to then go on to discussing uh, qfts so before that uh, let me just pause and ask if there are any questions yeah please ask questions up to this point yeah i'm sorry i was a bit fast towards the end but then you can uh, can ask me anything yeah so i have a question yeah so hey since the grant uh, can you speak a little bit loud yeah so in the exchange diagrams the vertices are like high cube type right so how we accommodate phi for theory in that case we take no uh, no so the this this as i told you is a kinematical basis so this is actually uh, an exchange for any any uh, so so for example the this could be a phi square operator as well so i i am not specifying what operator is getting exchange i am just specifying the quantum numbers okay. so that part is fixed by symmetry i think that that is what even uh, 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 carlos was asking that how much of it is actually fixed by symmetries so you see the form of the uh, witten diagram this form that i have written down here this is valid for any delta and any l so this tau here is the twist tau actually is delta minus l so this this is valid for any exchange diagram okay okay you said uh, that you get uh, the 7f6 uh, functions which are six j samples for yeah. uh, for which group sorry which sorry can you repeat that which uh, for, uh, for which group do you have a, uh, is is it for the conformal group or is it for some no so this is uh, so so the generalized 6j symbols uh, with uh, which uh, with integer entries or i think half integer entries those are for sun uh but uh the versions which we have which have got non integer entries these are they are supposed to be the 6j symbols for non compact groups so uh, which groups uh, do you, do you so know for example sl sl2 2r would be one one such group ah okay but sl2r is is related to conformal symmetry in, in some sense yeah sense. yeah so uh reynolds 1979 paper has a lot more details about this so i would i would recommend this hey, and in that can i follow yes. up on this question just now uh, yes. so this these symbols are the 6j symbols of sl2r you said yeah. but for, yeah for instance yes i mean they yeah could be yeah so so okay yeah let let me press on that point a bit uh, so shouldn't we get of the conformal group of the full conformal group the 6j why why we get sl2r oh uh in other words the calculation you do there with copa kumar that you mentioned right yes. you, you get the precise thing with precise coefficients uh, you say half integers right they are fractional yeah. 
no so what i meant was that for the compact groups the int, uh, the entries are uh, either uh, integers or half integers for for compact groups okay you are for non compact to... groups those are uh, uh, those could be non integers Good. so so the ones you get in your mm. calculation mm. which group are they either referring to yeah so we don't know whether it is sl2 or something else so if you are asking that okay. yeah so uh, it's some 7f6 um but you can do the same calculation uh, also in uh, so far as the, the usual conformal block is concerned i mean this was done by simmel duffin and other people as well so for the usual conformal group uh, and there they get the answer which is uh, written in terms of a difference of 2 4f3s and this the, the difference in terms of 2 4f3s is, is again a 7f6 so even in the usual calculation the for the conformal group the 6g symbol would be a 7f6 with with uh, with non integer entries it it could be a different 7f6 not the exact 7f6 that we have found but uh, it is there is some 7f6 in, in uh, with non integer entries in that story so suppose that you i were to do this calculation in in a conformal theory but with other symmetries also right so, since yes. it's super conformal say for example yes 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 will i still get f7 7 6 f7 7 f6 um i i'm not sure i believe so uh, i don't know if anybody has done the usual calculation uh, for a for a super conformal group okay 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 that's a good question i, I, I yeah i'm not sure thank you Have you looked up the context uh, for uh, Ramanujan's work of, on 7F6 in, in his last notebook? Yes, in fact, I have the last uh, notebook. Uh, in fact, uh, there's some. Uh, the, so, uh, I mean, it's not very clear what, what he was looking at. I mean, uh, there are these uh, well poised 7F6 which have got very special properties. And so th there's some relation that the upper seven coefficients satisfy with respect to the lower seven coefficients. And uh, that makes it have more symmetry. So there is some uh, tetrahedral symmetry that these well poised seven and six have. Now, why he was looking at it, I have no idea. I mean, I think only Ramanujan knew why he was looking at it. I don't think he was looking at it from, a, from the perspective of a, uh, of a, of, of a special application. Um, yeah. No one. Yeah, uh, no one understands that. But uh, since he was looking at at yeah, 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 <laughs> which are related to comp to quantum field theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> you might uh, if you look at his books. I mean, you might discover an identity which is which might be useful for you. I, I, yeah, it's hard to know. Uh, Hi. So, uh, by the way, this 7F6 uh, was also studied by Raka. So, I remember giving this talk in front of an Israeli audience and they also pointed out that uh, I should have included Raka's name as well. Yes, yeah, somebody had a question. Hi, uh, the spurious hole you mentioned, right? Yes. Uh, is that related to the spurious hole appear in BCFW methods? Uh, no, I, I, this is different. So the, this this spurious pole is uh, something that uh, the formalism uh, introduces. It, it comes from basically not being able to throw away these double trace operators. So these double trace operators. So I, I call this a double trace operators because the the scaling dimension of this operator that comes from these poles uh, is two delta phi plus two n, and so it's two delta phi. That's why it's double trace. There are two phi's roughly speaking. Uh, now, these are physical operators in ADS safety in the strict n going to infinity limit. Now, if you are not in the n going to infinity limit, then there are no such operators. I mean, unless and until there's some super symmetry that protects these operators. So that is why the, these the contribution from this factor are spurious. And they'll also give you spurious powers of you. So in that sense, they're spurious. Yeah. I think it's different from the spurious, spurious pose that you get in PCF. Okay. I had a question. Yeah. Uh, so, like uh, when you are solving this bootstrap equation and showing the graph that there are two kind of contribution which will uh, basically cancels up to give the second derivative of the conformal partial with vanishing. One is large spin part and one is some small spin part, and the conformal dimension is near probably d minus two by two kind of thing. 
Mm-hmm. So, uh, so for the, oh, so is there any uh, understanding in the mean field theory point of view? What will be this uh, lowest? What will be this spin zero scalar operator which have some maximum behavior to cancel? Uh, the effect of the last spin oh. part. So, oh, yeah, that's a good question. So you are saying that whether we can put a bound on uh, delta phi square, and uh, analytically, is that is that what you are asking? Oh, yes, yes. Means so, is that the phi square is the operator first of yes. all? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So here uh, we are actually liter- literally sitting at the kink. So, uh, okay. so, so, yeah. But it's a good question. Can we analytically bound? Put some bound maybe in some epsilon expansion. It's a it's a great question. I don't know. Okay. Okay. One question. One question yes. concerning yes, yes. Uh, the the islands you had. Yes. Presumably, uh, will converge to uh, to a point. Are these islands you you get from your equations or are they? No, that is from the usual approach, which is uh, solving s equal to t. So if you remember. Uh, I told you that uh, there are two ways of thinking about this. So you, this is the traditional approach. This is where you equate the sum over usual conformal partial ways, but you impose crossing symmetry as a condition. And this is kind of hard to do. Uh, you can. It's kind of hard to do analytics with this because uh, to reproduce the one operator, say you say, say you have the identity operator on the left hand side, you require an infinite number of operators on the right hand side. So that's why it makes it uh, a little hard to use this equation directly. I mean, people have found uh, ways of doing it, but it's still hard. And so this approach that I've uh, explained, this actually gives you a way of doing this, at least so far as epsilon expansion is concerned, uh, quite easily. For the phi square, it's it's, it's very, very easy to get the uh, epsilon square result. Yeah, so the question is, uh, can you get some uh, similar bounds uh, where you at, at least can hope that they will converge to a point. And yeah, so yeah, that's what uh, I think that is the goal. Uh, so you would want to use a version of this method to quickly converge to that point. Uh, so this is what uh, I think is the goal ultimately. So this is what uh, this optimal functionals or uh, analytic functionals that, we, that uh, various people are developing uh, is trying to do. Yeah, so that is precisely the point. I mean, you you expect to do, you, you expect to solve the the question that you just now asked. Yes. Okay. So uh, I seem to have done very badly with time, uh, but I can quickly tell you a bit about uh, QFT bootstrap because this is where it started off. And no, this is uh, you are doing perfectly. <laughs> okay. Uh, how long do you think I have that? And then I'll paste it accordingly. No, no, no. You, you can continue because a lot of questions you have uh, answered. So you can continue. Okay. I, okay. Will, I will ask you to stop at least 10 minutes ago. Okay. Okay. So uh, let me just tell you about uh, QFT bootstrap. And this is less developed than the conformal bootstrap. Although uh, the, the current uh, program uh, draws inspiration from the conformal bootstrap program. So the, the, the historically, the S-matrix bootstrap is older than the CFT bootstrap. So uh, the S-matrix, the idea of the S-matrix was first uh, postulated by John Wheeler in 1937. And then uh, Heisenberg in 1943. And this, this is historically very interesting because uh, this was wartime and Heisenberg was busy with the war. And then he was also working on this amazing stuff. It's incredible. And... Uh, he, in 1943, he said that, uh, yeah, the S matrix is the way of uh, way to think about uh, quantum field theory. And then, of course, uh, as happens, there was a time lag. But basically, in the 1960s, and there's some there's another paper in nine, uh, in the 1950s by Landau. So uh, these are usually uh, the influential works which led to the S matrix bootstrap program. But uh, the S matrix bootstrap was basically Jeffrey Chu's program. So if you Google S matrix bootstrap or bootstrap, you will see you're you're left to choose bootstrap. So he very, uh, for for a long time, he worked on this. And there are other people also, Mandelstam, uh, uh, Martha, uh, uh, Frasad, they all contributed a lot. I mean, there's a lot of uh, work activity in the 1960s. There There was a Cambridge group as well, which has this famous book called the Analytic S matrix, I'm sure. 
uh, there are other people who contributed enormously. They thought uh, about this program. Um, but again, uh, it lay dormant because QCD was invented. Uh, QCD gave you a calculational framework. You were able to do a lot of things uh, till uh, these people came along. And so some of these people were original contributors to the conformal bootstrap program as well. For example, Miguel was one of them. Bart Van Ries was one of them. Uh, and there are other extremely clever people on this paper. And they sort of re rebooted the S-matrix bootstrap roughly in 2016. And the phenomenological application, which I'm going to focus on, uh, was a paper in 2018. Uh, so this appeared in the physical review letters. And this, uh, this constrains pion scattering. And I should tell you that this S matrix bootstrap is still uh, pretty uh, developing. I mean, it, it's being developed. Uh, it's not that well, well explored or well understood as the conformal bootstrap. So it's something that is uh, an ongoing work. So as I said, the idea of the S matrix was introduced by Wheeler and then a lot of people contributed, Landau, Chu, Mandelstam, Lehman, uh, Martha in the 1960s. And the basic philosophy of the S matrix bootstrap program is to do away with the quantum field. So you don't want to talk in terms of a quantum field because people felt that that, is the, that was the root cause for uh, all the miseries, all the infinities and so on. So uh, they wanted to think whether you could just deal, deal directly with observables. So again, as with any bootstrap, the basic principles were Lorentz invariance, uh, unitarity, analyticity, and the more precise versions of, uh, of what these things mean. Analyticity is some, it means something in this program. I will, I will talk about a uh, uh, certain kind of analyticity in a bit. And uh, then you ask, uh, if you have crossing conditions, then somehow uh, can you see some special feature such that you can identify the standard model? Of course, the answer is no, not yet, because uh, if, if crossing was sufficiently constraining and it gave you uh, the standard model, that would be it. Um, so compared to the conformal side, we have lost some symmetry. So you don't have the conformal symmetry, we just have Lorentz invariance. So we will need to work harder. And uh, of course, what, what does work harder mean? That you, you may need to put in more assumptions. Uh, so we'll see what these assumptions are. And I have mentioned these two points already that historically this matrix uh, story was developed before the CFT, sto CFT bootstrap story. And, uh, and also, uh, if you remember, Rege, the Rege behavior plus crossing is what gave rise to string theory. So we are doing just usual scattering. This is what you would be familiar with in any quantum in any quantum field theory course. You have two incoming particles in the center of mass frame, and you have two outgoing particles. So, uh, to describe this process, you write down Mandel's time variables. So, this is in the Lorentz invariant theory. Uh, in principle, you can do it in any theory, provided you know the appropriate symmetries and pro appropriate invariants. Um, and so these are the usual Mandel's time invariants. This theta is an angle. This tells you what is the angle between the incoming uh, particle A and the outgoing particle D. Uh, so if you have all particles of equal masses, it has a simple formula. Unequal masses, it makes it a bit more complicated, but all this is all known, very well known. So the cos of this angle uh, is one plus two T over S minus four M squared. And uh, if you want to consider physical scattering, so something that you can think in terms of the center of mass energies, then S has to be bigger than 4m square, and uh, T has to be less than zero, so, so that you get cos theta to lie between minus one and one. So that is a physical region, T less than zero and S greater than 4m square. Um, and uh, you have this standard uh, amplitude. So this is the scattering amplitude. This, this is literally the, uh, amplitude that describes the overlap of the in state with the outgoing final state. Uh, so this is in terms of m of st. So if you wrote on an s matrix, you would write it as s equals to one plus i t, and then t uh, is an operator. So t uh, for a two to two scattering, you would pick up matrix elements, uh, and it would give you these. So this is uh, after stripping off the momentum conserving delta functions. So this is completely standard. And then what you do, uh, so you would try to do a partial wave expansion. 
So the partial wave expansion gives you these partial wave coefficients, which are functions of s. And so, and uh, you would get the Legendre polynomial. So the, the Legendre polynomials here uh, are functions of cos theta. So uh, this is quite standard. And then uh, you would uh, ask, what is the constraint that you get from unitarity? So unitarity actually tells you that uh, f of l square, the absolute value of f of l. So this can be complex as well. So uh, this is basically uh, coming from the optical theorem. Uh, that, that mod of f of l square should be less than the imaginary part of f of l, and this should be less than one. So this is the this is in the this is what you would get. So this is uh, some standard kinematics, and then when we talk about analytic structure, what do we mean? So uh, in the S matrix, uh, there would be some cuts. So suppose you're describing massive particles, so massive external states. And you know that there are uh, there could be bound states that are exchanged. So if there are bound states, those would show up as poles in the in the in the amplitude in, in M. Uh, but there are also threshold cuts that would correspond to two particles or three particles or four particles getting exchanged. So if you think in terms of the optical theorem, uh, you can think in terms of uh, the complete set of states that you write down. And in the complete set of states, you'll have single particle, two particles, three particles, and so on. So that would give rise to these cuts. So this is the two particle cut and this will be the three particle cut or four particle cut depending on whether you have a Z2 symmetry, you'll have either a straight a four particle cut or a two particle cut and a four particle cut. And if you don't have a Z2 symmetry, you have a two particle cut, three particle cut and so on. And it is conventional to draw the branch cut uh, along the real axis. So of course branch cuts you can place whatever in whatever way you want, but this is conventional because uh, you don't have to draw a separate cut for each of these uh, higher thresholds. So that is on the uh, that is on the S side. So this is in the complex S plane, by the way. Uh, but you also have from crossing symmetry because this condition is satisfied. S plus T plus U is equal to four M square. Um, and uh, for fixed T, you will have the uh, branch cuts corresponding to U. So that that is what gives gives rise to the left hand cut. So the right hand cut is the uh, is what you would get uh, from the S. And this this would be the consequence of crossing. And uh, of course, this is the complex S plane. So I have to tell you uh, to specify what a physical amplitude means. And the physical amplitude tells you, and and there are cuts as well. So I have to tell you how I'm. Uh, I have to go and uh, by physical amplitude means that I have to start off somewhere here in the complex plane and approach the real axis. So the way to get the physical amplitude is to go from above the cut and approach it. So in particular, suppose uh, you had some, you knew that there was some pole here in the lower half plane. Why will you have a pole in the lower half plane? So those would correspond to resonances. So resonances uh, would have a real part and an imaginary part and the sign of the imaginary part should be negative. Uh, and roughly speaking, that is because you have e to the power minus i times energy times t and you want this wave function to die. So the, uh, the, the imaginary part should be negative. And uh, if this is negative, and suppose you're starting from here to approach this, um, you can draw a straight line and it go through the cut. So that would mean that this uh, pole should be in the second sheet. It is not in, on the first sheet. So obviously, uh, you have to specify uh, which sheet you are in uh, when you're talking about uh, poles. So resonances will be poles, but they'll be poles in the second sheet. And they, that, that is kind of important. I'll, I'll explain why that, why that is important later on. And also you make an assumption of maximal analyticity it means that there are no other singularities in, in the complex S plane. Uh, can I ask a question? So yeah. in, the, in the last slide, like you know, the uh, optical theorem expression, whatever you have given in terms of partial coefficient. So like in usually we will consider like SS dagger to be identity, then why there is less or equal? Like it should, why, oh, why not? That equal? is because so uh, uh, SS dagger equal to identity means what? So SS dagger identity means that one plus IT times one plus IT dagger is equal right. to one. Right. So that would mean that the imaginary part of T minus T dagger is equal to T, T dagger, right. right? And then what do you do? So you actually uh, put uh, initial state and final state, you sandwich initial state and final state. So right. on the left-hand side, you have imaginary part of T minus T dagger, uh, so I right. of T minus T dagger between I and F. And on the right-hand side, you have T T dagger uh, sandwich between I and F. Mm -hmm. Now you put in complete set of states. 
So okay. the complete, yeah. So the complete set of states on the right hand side. So you're doing the complete set of states on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing the complete set of states on the right hand side, if you restrict it only to the two particle states, okay. you would get an inequality. You wouldn't get okay. an inequality. Right, right, right. Yeah. So like, uh, so this expression like cannot be done like if there is a multi particle state and can be improved the inequality or yeah, it can be improved. In fact, uh, uh, there are things. Uh, so for example. If you know for a fact that there should not be any particle production between these two branch points, then mm -hmm. you, 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 you get what are called elastic unitarity conditions, which uh, in fact are quite interesting and I'll, I'll mention them later on, but you, you can improve them. So this is, uh, this, th this has to be satisfied, but you can improve on that. You can make it more constrained. Okay. And the other thing is that this maximal analyticity assumptions, whatever you are making, but this, I think it's not proved, right? Because people only yeah. know in some certain right. analytic domain of that electricity. Is right. That is right. It's an assumption. So there is no first principles proof of this. It's absolutely yeah. what you're saying is absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I also have a question. So like uh, we have this S plus T plus U equals 4M square condition. And uh, in the previous slide, we had this cos theta expressed in terms of T and S. So yeah. We can still have both of these conditions if we have S uh, negative and T uh, positive yes. instead of the other way around. So uh, uh, then why don't we do that? No, because uh, if you, uh, so S, if you express it in terms of, uh, so here uh, you can express it in terms of uh, the mass and uh, the uh, just, uh, just invariant energy. Like, uh, yeah. I don't mean it in terms, uh, this thing I don't mean in physical terms. I just mean like a trick. Like the absolute trick yes. we do. Yes, yes, so, you can so do that. This I mean, need in not fact, be physical. Yes, yes, yes. You can certainly do that. So I'm I'm saying that the physical uh, physical regions would be what you, what gives these Mandelstam regions. So yeah. So you get s greater than four, t less than zero, and so and the corresponding uh, t greater than four, uh, u less than zero, and so on. Thank yeah, you. You, can, you can consider, well, yeah, that is precisely the point. One of the things is to treat this as a complex variable and then make it even bigger than one or make it uh, assume complex values. Certainly you can do that. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, let's say that you were naive and you wanted to write down the crossing equation. So crossing equation would be that M of ST is equal to M of TS. Again, let's consider identical scattering again, for simplicity. So you get some equation like this. And what would you do? So you again, you would write it as a partial wave expansion, like what we did in conformal field theory. So we wrote it as a uh, expanded in terms of conform conformal partial wave. So let's try to expand it in terms of uh, the usual partial waves. So you get some equation like this. So here, the unknowns would be this uh, function, f of l, which is a function of s. So even if you use the orthogonality property of PL, you would get F of L, which is a function of S on one side, and it would be a very complicated object on the right hand side. Because PL is orthogonal with respect to this variable and on the right hand side, you have a different variable. So the right hand side would still look very complicated. So F of, F of L would look like some, some, some integral and F of L would again appear on the right hand side where the argument would be T and then you would do, need to do an integral over S. Uh, over x. So obviously, this wouldn't get you much mileage. Uh, at least naively, it would appear that you wouldn't get much mileage. It would it would be hard to solve. Uh, and also, suppose you had a, an x channel pole and you were trying to reproduce it from the cross cross side. So it, the there's a pole on the left hand side, uh, but this is a polynomial in s on the right hand side. So to reproduce a pole in S using polynomials in S, you'd require an infinite number of them. So that's what makes this equation quite hard. So, you, so how do you proceed? So you, of course, uh, uh, don't use uh, the naive approach. You would do something different. And this was what uh, these gentlemen here did. Uh, they did a, a, a conformal map. So they mapped this cut plane. Uh, they mapped it to a disk. And the branch cut got mapped to the boundary of the disk. This is the conformal transformation that does it. And the branch cut got mapped to the conformal, uh, the, the, the boundary of the disk. And basically, the branch cut is the one that goes from 4 to infinity. 
So what happens to nine to infinity and so on that is not very clear so, so far as this transformation is concerned. So this transformation only makes the cut from four to infinity manifest. And uh, uh, the left-hand object, the left-hand cut gets mapped to some, somewhere in the inside. So basically this whole complex plane gets mapped to the disk. And that's kind of night, um, uh, quite neat. So what you do is you write down the amplitude in terms of an expansion using this maximal analyticity condition that uh, maybe if, if there are explicit poles corresponding to bound state, you separate them out. And if you don't have any explicit poles, this term is not there. And you expand that in terms of this uh, rho s, rho t, and rho u, because the, the cut uh, property in the complex s plane is, uh, is included in this variable rho s. So here, a, b, and c are integers. So you don't have any negative powers. And so you can just expand it like this. And these alpha ABCs are coefficients. So you, you will have to make this symmetric so that you, this is manifestly crossing symmetric. So ABC has to be uh, symmetric so that this is manifestly crossing symmetric. And uh, uh, so then you would get a manifestly crossing symmetric uh, expression for M. So crossing symmetry is taken care of, but you, are, you ne next have to check for unitarity, these partial wave unitarity conditions. So you have to make sure that this condition is respected. So you still have to check for unitarity. And it turns out that the, these unitarity conditions, and it's quite non-trivial because you see the conditions here, f of L, are quadratic because this is square. And so these would be naively quadratic in the alphas, these, these unknown coefficients. Our job is to constrain these alphas. But nonetheless, you can show that this can be recast into a semi-definite programming problem. So, uh, that is the that is what uh, the story is that you can write this amplitude. Uh, the job is to figure alpha, and uh, you you can do it again for uh, not just uh, identical scalars, but you can do it for say pion scattering. So pion scattering in in chiral perturbation theory, you think of pions as scalars uh, three of three different kinds, and so you have an O3 generalization. You can do it quite straightforwardly. Uh, but the key idea is that this uh, unitarity condition gets mapped to a semi-definite programming problem. And why is this important? Because from the conformal bootstraps story, we know how to use uh, semi-definite programming numerically. So wh wh what is it that you would like to constrain? So you want to constrain pion scattering. So let me just quickly tell you something about pions. So there are three kinds of pions. Uh, there's the neutral and the, the charged pions. In terms of the masses, the thing to note is that the, uh, there's a real part and an imaginary part. Why is there an imaginary part? If there is an imaginary part because the pions have a finite lifetime. But uh, in terms of the mass, the imaginary part is very close to the real axis because the real part is one and the imaginary part is so small. And then you can have resonances. Uh, so you, you, have, you have all kinds of resonances. So these resonances lie on these regular trajectories. The thing to note is that the real part and the imaginary part of these resonances are kind of comparable, unlike what happens to the pions. So you can think of the pions as sort of stable particles in this approximation and these as unstable particles. And uh, you have information about all kinds of resonances. So you can go to the PDG handbook. It's a fun thing to do. It's available online and you can actually uh, do this exercise of expressing all these resonances in terms of the pion mass. So these are all these spins. So you have uh, various spin resonances and it's known up to spin six. And if you know, if you plot these, then the real part against, uh, so this is the real part. Uh, M square is the real part of, well, M, M is complex, but you uh, do M square and then you take the real part. So this is what M square means. And you plot J versus M squared, you'll see that you'll get a, almost a straight line graph. So how do we express this? So if you, uh, so this is the analog of the epsilon expansion that uh, I reviewed uh, using uh, Wilson, uh, what Wilson Fisher had developed. So in order to ex understand this, these features or even write down, to, I mean, you don't really understand these features. These are not things that you can understand from first principles. These are used as experimental inputs. But you can study pion scattering and then you can ask whether can we uh, calculate 
the say the phase shifts or the uh, scattering lens of the scattering amplitude uh, using some field theory. So there is a very famous effective field theory which is called chiral perturbation theory. This was first done by Weinberg and then developed by Gasser, Lutweiler, uh, S. M. Roy, uh, then my C. H. E. P. colleague and Anand has also made contributions in this area. Uh, but basically, you can think in terms of various processes individually. So you can think in terms of pi naught, pi naught going to pi naught, pi naught separate from pi naught, pi naught going to pi plus, pi minus, and so on. So you can consider uh, projected amplitudes. And for each of these amplitudes, you can do a partial wave expansion. You can label it in a similar way. This is just a generalization of uh, the single scalar case to three scalars. So Weinberg showed, and this is a famous result, that if you look at the partial wave amplitudes, so this is the spin zero partial wave amplitude in the ISO spin zero channel. So there are three channels, the three channels, ISO spin channels, zero, one, and two, and each channel is labeled by the spin L, which corresponds to the partial wave spin. You can see very easily that there are zeros in these, uh, in these partial wave amplitudes. And these are what are called Adler zeros. There's a fundamental reason why they exist, and this was first demonstrated by Adler using partially conserved uh, axial currents. Um, and they should be, they should exist not only perturbatively, but they should exist also non-perturbatively. So this is just a leading order zero. So the leading order zero that is at 0 0.5 and uh, two, so S not equal to 0.5 and S2 equal to two, just have this in mind. This is just the leading order in perturbation theory result. So you can, in some sense, this is the free result. So, we want to describe pion scattering using the bootstrap. Basically, we want to constrain alphas and then we want to see what to get. So what are the ingredients to put in? We, we have to put in something. If you don't put in some extra ingredients, you're not going to get any constraint. So for example, in the conformal bootstrap, we had delta of the leading scalar on the y-axis and delta of phi in the x-axis. So what are the analogs of that delta s and delta phi? So here, because we know that there should be Adler zeros, we will take the x-axis x -axis to be s0 and s, the y-axis to be s2. And we know, roughly speaking, where the perturbative zeros are. But we want this to be non-perturbative. And the other thing to note is that the perturbative zeros are for unphysical S's, because this is 0.5, and the physical S is greater than 4. So this, this is unphysical S. So this is not something that you can observe. And the other ingredient that we're going to put in, and this is just following whatever the, uh, these gentlemen had done, again, uh, we, you can actually show that if you don't put in this, you're not going to get anything you require at least one resonance. You require to put in the information about one resonance. So we'll put in the information about the row resonance. This is the leading order resonance, the spin one resonance here. So you'll put in the information about this guy. I mean, you can put in the information about this guy as well, but the sigma is a, kind of a controversial particle. So uh, this is better known. And as I said, resonances are poles in the second sheet. Poles in the second sheet, turn out uh, because of the unitarity condition correspond to zeros in the physical in the first sheet. So that's what we're going to do. We are going to put this information in as a zero in the first sheet. And then uh, you can expand the partial wave coefficients in, uh, this is called the threshold expansion. This gives you physically measurable quantities, which are called scattering lengths and effective ranges. So this is what scattering length and effective ranges mean. You're just expanding the real part of the partial wave. Uh, in the, like this. And these are the numbers that you want to extract. So basically, if you have a solution to the bootstrap equation, you want to extract these quantities and then you want to go and compare with, compare with experiments. So what do you get? So you, if you incorporate the row resonance and then you dial S0 and S2, you get a constrained region. The constrained region is obtained in the following way. That the one thing is that we require to have zeros in the partial waves, which correspond to the Adler zeros. So here, the blue line corresponds to the maximum of the uh, isospin 2 L0 partial wave. This is the maximum in, in S. And this brown line corresponds to the minimum. So if the maximum and minimum have the same sign, that would mean that you cannot have any zero because you require there to be a sign change. So you require the amplitude to hit a zero. That would, uh, this would be the zero. So if you are in between this region, so this is actually the S naught. So this is for fixed S2, I'm dialing S naught. 
You can do it either ways. You can fix uh, S0 and dial S2 as well. You'll get a similar kind of behavior. You'll get disallowed regions. So not any arbitrary point in the S0, S2 plane is allowed. When you do this, you get a disallowed region which corresponds to the lake. And this is what these gentlemen here found. So any point here is disallowed. The white region is disallowed. So in fact, the perturbative point, which is a free theory, is in the disallowed region, which is basically reflecting the fact that a resonance is a non-perturbative phenomena. You, you cannot see it in perturbation theory. Um, so of course, if you you can you, you can ask where does the one loop point sit, and the one loop point in fact sits close to the boundary of the allowed region. So you get a whole big region of allowed S matrices. So anything here could describe your physical uh, S matrix. So this wasn't very constraining. So can we do something better? So what these gentlemen did was uh, they put in, in addition to this row resonance, they also put in the experimental scattering lengths. So it's like, in some sense, you can think that this is like admitting defeat, but uh, there's some rationale behind this. You want to ask if you put in the S and P V scattering lengths. So there are lot, all kinds of scattering lengths. So scattering lengths, remember, they're labeled by L, and L runs from zero to infinity. So there are infinite power, infinite scattering lengths. So they put in the information about the S and P wave. S wave means L equal to zero and P wave means L equal to one. So they put in this uh, fact that the S and P wave scattering lengths are experimentally known. The rationale behind this was you want to see whether the, the allowed region shrinks to a point or maybe a very small region. So they got a smaller region. So now the allowed region is in this blue. Blue is always allowed, white is always disallowed. Allowed region is blue, but still there are a lot of S matrices which are compatible with these experimental scattering lengths. Okay, so so now uh, the question is that uh, can we uh, can we sort of relax this condition? We don't want to put in the experimental lengths, but uh, somehow other theoretical considerations can we put in some other theoretical considerations and get a restricted region? So this is what we did in a paper, which we put out very recently, maybe a week or so back. So our input was the row resonance and uh, certain dispersion relation constraints. Now these dispersion relation constraints, um, I'll only briefly have time to explain, but there is another way of motivating these dispersion relation constraints, which is using a quantum information theoretic quantity called relative entropy. And I will briefly explain what that is. When you put in this, uh, these constraints, these conditions, then you get a new allowed region, which is a river. So, uh, of course, there's a, still a, a lot of potential, potentially interesting S matrices which live inside the river, but a lot of the regions, allowed regions, the possibilities have been ruled out. So, there are some interesting features here. So, here is the lake that we consider, so that is already ruled out. And this is the peninsula. So, so this is the peninsula that. Uh, these gentlemen here had found. So this is the peninsula inside the river. Now, of course, our uh, region is bigger than what the peninsula is because, of course, we did not put in any experimental input. Now, but the curious point is that uh, this red cross is the one-loop chiral perturbation theory result, which apparently explains experimental observations reasonably well. So the curious point to note is that this, this uh, one loop chiral perturbation theory point actually lies very close to the boundary of the allowed region. And also it seems to lie close to some, some kink type phenomena. So in the 3D IZ model, you remember that the physical theory lay close to a kink. And uh, this is quite interesting. We are still investigating whether this is just a numerical artifact, whether there's literally a kink or whether there's a smooth crossover, but it does seem like there is a sharp transition that is happening very close to this point. Um, so you, you could say that, oh, why, why did you stop at one loop? So this is an effective field theory. So you, you have to work really hard to do uh, higher loops. The state of the art in chiral perturbation theory is that you know two loop chiral perturbation theory results and the two loop chiral perturbation theory is a little bit inside, but, but not much. So these uh, gentlemen here, so this is Anjishnu Bose. Uh, he did his master's thesis with me. This is Parthiv Haldar. Uh, he is my graduate student. Uh, this is me. Uh, this is Prithish Sena. He's of no, he's no rel relative of mine, but he was also doing his master's with me. And this is Shashwat Tiwari, uh, also doing his master's. So basically three master's students. 
and uh, one graduate student. And uh, so, uh, so another question that you can ask whenever you see this allowed region is that, okay, uh, say I consider a theory here and another theory here. Uh, how far are these in theory space? So can I distinguish this theory from this theory? Because after all, in some scattering length, uh, from a, uh, some scattering length point of view, uh, these are supposed to be the same. Because remember that this entire region of allowed theories give the same S, S and P wave scattering lengths. So from the point of view of S wave and P wave scattering lengths, a theory here would give you the same, uh, the same results as a theory here. So in what sense is a theory here different from the theory there? Of course, you can consider higher uh, spin scattering lengths and so on and distinguish them. But maybe there is a better way of uh, ask, answering this question. So uh, in yes. the previous plot, what yes. this blue dotted line corresponds to? Uh, blue dotted line. This was a lake. So you remember that there were two interesting regions that people had found. One of them was a lake. And this was obtained by just using the row resonance as the input. So nothing about scattering lengths. So this peninsula was obtained by including row resonance plus experimental S and P wave results. So obviously by construction, you get a smaller region, mm -hmm. but how small is small? So here you don't get a small region. You get a, you get a very big region. So anything here is allowed, but the input was only the row resonance. Okay. So to address this issue about how to distinguish theories, you require, we, we looked at uh, what is called relative entropy. And the relative entropy is a, is a concept in, uh, in quantum information theory. If you have two density matrices, so the density matrices could be one density matrix descri describing the 2 to 2 scattering here, and another density matrix describing the 2 to 2 scattering here. And you, you calculate this quantity, which is the trace of rho log rho. So this is rho 1 log rho 1 minus rho 1 log rho 2. So rho 1 is, uh, let's say, the upper density matrix, and rho 2 is the lower density matrix. And this gives you a, a measure of distinguishability between the two density matrices. And you could do the, this relative entropy a bit differently as well. So you can have a detector here and a, another detector here. And you could ask, uh, can I distinguish the density matrix here from a density matrix here? And that actually gives you a lot of interesting things. And I will very quickly uh, go through this. Uh, another thing I should point out is that we are not the first people to be studying entanglement and scattering. This was done previously as well, but they had studied entanglement entropy and entanglement entropy turns out to be uh, ill-defined because there are infinities. So, and uh, the relative entropy is finite. There, is, there are no infinities. Uh, so very briefly to flash some formulas, the relative entropy turns out to be related to the uh, absolute value of the, of the matrix element square. That is the power of the relative entropy. It's, it's a simple thing. And uh, you can consider various uh, cases. You can consider detectors at different positions, or you can consider different theories. G of x here is a support function. It basically makes the, uh, gives you support uh, at the angle x. Uh, x here is cos theta. And it's a simple exercise also because of the concavity property of the log to show that this quantity is always bigger than 0. And I said that you can consider two different probability distributions in two different senses. One is that you can consider in, uh, you can think of detectors at two different locations, or you can think of detectors at the same location, but two different theories trying to explain that observation. So using this uh, second point of view, let me just quickly flash one thing. So in the beginning, I told you that uh, there are these rigid trajectories, but the rigid trajectories are not really straight lines. They have a curvature. And the curvature is positive. So using some consistency conditions, can we explain the sign of that curvature? And it turns out to be yes. The sign of the curvature turns out to be positive. It has a quantum information theoretic explanation. Uh, so you, 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 you write down a, a form of the rigid trajectory in the large S fixed T limit. This M actually takes on this form. This alpha T is the rigid trajectory. And if you calculate this relative entropy, it will turn out that it will be proportional to the curvature. So alpha 2 is the curvature. And depending on the sign of alpha 2, it is either positive or negative. So this alpha 2 controls whether this quantity, I have subtracted off a hard sphere part. You can ask me later why, what this is. But this quantity is actually sensitive to the non-linearity of the rigid theory. So there is an argument why this must be positive. The argument runs as follows. And this is where these old results. So people in the 1960s 
had a lot of results. Um, so there was a Frossard bound. People had studied a bound on the elastic differential cross section. The Frossard bound was a bound on the total differential, uh, total uh, cross section, uh, under certain assumptions. Uh, there were bounds on the total differential cross section as well. Uh, sorry, the elastic differential cross section as well. And people who know a bit of particular physics will know that this mod m squared is related to the elastic differential cross section. So basically, it gets related to these elastic differential cross section bounds. So these gentlemen had looked at long time back, uh, looked at uh, the elastic differential cross section bounds, and it turns out that these high energy bounds put, makes this positive or needs this to be positive, so that I can smoothly consider the Rege limit with these high energy limits. If if this wasn't positive, then there would be some discontinuous jump. So for smoothly connecting up, smoothly sewing up these two regions, you require the curvature to be positive. So this is our explanation. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, this is the first time there is a, an explanation to the positivity of this curvature. You can do other things as well. And this is uh, something that you can learn in uh, this very nice review by Wheaton from 2018. You can consider two different theories. And you can ask, how different are these theories? So the, how different these theories are, which is called hypothesis testing, is governed by relative entropy. So D is a relative, relative entropy. N is the number of measurements that you're making. So the bigger the relative entropy, the lower the number of measurements you have to make to make this uh, to be of a certain constant tolerance, supply tolerance. Suppose you want to, want to know the answer within a certain tolerance. Sorry, Aninda, can, can I yes. ask one question? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, you had, uh, you know, you got a constant on alpha 2 by looking at, uh, you know, some relative entropy between, you basically define two density metrics and then, is there something alpha 3, alpha 4, are there, are there bounds on them or, you know, can you define say tripe and uh, like... A, Positivity, you're asking. Uh, you're asking about positivity, so are all, the, all of these coefficients positive or a definite sign? Yeah, is, is this known or...? No. It's a good question. Uh, nothing is known. And do you think like I can define like analog of tripartite entanglement? Et yes. Et oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I think you can do a lot of things. It's uh, simply something that people have not explored. I think you can, there's a lot of particle physics data. So using that data, I think you, you can ask, uh, you can test uh, uh, strong subattitivity and all these things. Uh, and I think these are quite doable, in fact. Yeah. Can I ask the question like whether this alpha t cannot go like more than t square or is there such kind of bounds? No, uh, the, there is no, nothing that is known. In fact, it's dot dot dot. I just simply didn't write it. So this is actually valid only in the small t limit. So yeah, so yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so, I, so it's I, I not like it. that in usual amplitudes, you considered that this Rege growth should have no. was like some no, no bound such kind of thing. Yeah, no, no, not for, not for alpha t. So there is no such bound for alpha t. In fact, uh, you can try to write down some string theory model, which mm -hmm. explains this uh, positive curvature. In fact, there are string theory models, but those are sort of cooked up models. So you require some variable tension model. So you can look at this paper that is okay. right here. This cooks up a model which gives you some positive curvature. Okay, thank you. But you, you want a model dependent on, uh, argument, you see. So this one is a model, uh, sort of almost a model independent argument. For the positivity of the curvature. Yeah, I was asking because of the fact that I think people assume that probably uh, like that uh, when uh, some scattering is happening for large s value, it mostly it can maximally go like s squared, not yes. beyond that. Yes, that's a great question. Uh, in fact, here uh, we are in the uh, uh, we, we are we are in the Rege limit, so you are assuming that s uh, s goes to infinity but fixed t, uh, and you uh, so so the kind of things that you are you are you have in mind is for mass uh, so massless scattering, so if, if there's a massless exchange. So I think you are you, you have in mind the chaos bound type things, yeah. Okay, okay. But uh, remember that we are talking about massive quantum field theory, so we are making some assumptions. So one of them is that there are no massless exchanges. Right, so right. we are assuming that only uh, there, there is massive exchanges. And also there are no massless bound states. So in the pion scattering, that is why pion scattering is such a uh, favorite or fa sort of favorite example for people to study is that uh, there are only these cuts. Okay. Yeah. 
so what is actually the the mathematical object uh, you're driving at with that uh, i mean the when you think about the standard model yeah. and you take the limit for the und quark masses go to zero then you will have uh, pions which sort yeah. of decouple in some sense from the rest yeah. and all the the intricacies of the standard model only will leave uh, very few parameters yeah. So uh, maybe you can uh, describe that as, as some O n sigma model or something like yeah. that. So we, yeah. So we are actually in the, uh, we are trying to, in some sense, we are trying to find a, find a non-perturbative version of the chiral perturbation theory, if you want. I, I think that is what we, uh, what this is going to describe. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So you can do hypothesis testing and then you can actually find out that uh, the green the theories uh, on the line on the green region are actually close to one another uh, depending on which which reaction you're constrained but you see the point is that here is a chiral perturbation theory here is a large space space of asymmetries now is there a way to constrain this uh, further so can you is, is there something that we missed such that this uh, sort of shrinks to the these regions or maybe something more gets ruled out so of course you can do that and we tried uh, more things so there is something called uh, positivity so uh, you can consider positivity in the extended mandelstam region so this is the mandelstam region I, I don't have time to explain to you what this mandelstam triangle is but uh, you can uh, find out in our paper but it turns out that in this extended mandelstam region uh, the amplitude satisfies certain positivity conditions so depending on which reaction you're looking at uh, it, the, any derivative, any two nth derivative, so these are even derivatives, it follows from uh, the Frossard Gribov representation uh, of the amplitude. No, oh, sorry, um, yeah, uh, you, you can show that uh, these should satisfy positivity conditions. Uh, so, in the inside this extended Mandelstam region, m is real, and that is why you can consider this uh, inequality because m, is, m in general uh, is a complex uh, quantity. Uh, but inside this region, it is real, and then you can study whether this these positivity conditions are respected or not. So this was uh, uh, the best place that we learned about this was uh, from this paper by Manohar and Matthew in 2008. And so you can impose these conditions. So these are linear conditions, thankfully. So you can uh, supplement in in SGPB. Technically, it turns out that you can supplement. Uh, linear conditions. There is no problem in supplementing linear conditions, but nonlinear conditions are very hard to add. And these are linear conditions, so thankfully you can uh, you can just add these inequalities on, and then what you get is a slightly smaller region. So this gray dotted line was the old region, old river, and using these positivity, some more region get chopped off, but not much. The river is slightly narrower, and the kink is still there. So this is what positivity gives you. Uh, so I should tell you that we examine positivity only in these corners. So in these points that are marked on this figure, because these, uh, in a bit, you will find out why, but, um, uh, it could be that if you examine more thoroughly, you'll get more constraining regions inside. So there's a, still a huge space of allowed region. I'm almost done by the way. So just two more slides and I'm done. So, so the question, of course, is why is the standard model special? What is so special about the standard model? I think more interestingly, what would happen is that here lies the chiral perturbation theory. Can we find another theory which reproduces exactly the same physics? I mean, that, that would be quite nice because then you can ask, why is this theory special compared to that other theory? Anyhow, so the questions are, what extra constraints? So we don't want to put in experimental inputs. Can we reduce this allowed region further? I mean, we want to understand why is there a king here? I don't know why there is a king. I mean, there uh, I threw my hands up in the air. I waved my hands around. I told you that there's some operator decoupling, uh, maybe something like a null state condition or something. And then uh, that's why there was a king. But here also there is a kind of a feature and also curiously the physical theory is lying on the boundary. So why is this happening? This is quite uh, interesting. Why, why is it? I mean, the more generic situation would be that here is the physical theory, right inside the middle of the river, not close to the boundary. Um, so another thing that one can do, and this is something that I think we are, we are trying to do now, uh, how close is the spectrum of resonances in the kink to the standard models? This is something that we can, we have these all these nice, interesting theories that we know 
that lie on the boundary. We can extract the resonances. We can plot rigid trajectories and go wild. And maybe one of these theories is closer to string theory than this, this, this point. The other suggestion that was made very recently by Korea, Sever, and Zivoidov is to consider elastic unitarity. So this is something that we did not consider. So elastic unitarity is the condition that in the uh, between 4 and 16, there is a Z2 symmetry. That's why 9 is not allowed. But between 4 and 16, you should not have particle production. So this is difficult to incorporate in the numerics because it's a nonlinear condition. Um, but they, are, they have suggested some different ways of looking at elastic unitarity. Maybe if you did look at elastic unitarity, you will get more constraints. And this is a promising direction to investigate. Now, OK, so let me just conclude with my wish list. Now, I, we examined this in, in the middle of uh, this COVID-19 thing. So we really couldn't uh, approach our universities to ask for more resources. So the, just to compare the kind of resources that we use to compare with, with the resources that people have been using. So the state of the art for the CFT bootstrap, I told you, is this massive mammoth machine, which has got 49,000 cores. And even the S-matrix attempts, which uh, gave these island, uh, this, this uh, lake and the, and the peninsula, uh, it had 2,400 cores. Now we sort of put together somehow 50 cores of computing power. So there were two workstations, one node in some one old cluster, uh, which belonged to one of my colleagues Sudhir. He very kindly allowed us access to that. Uh, so Sudhir, if you are listening, thanks. And uh, another in a heavily used cluster. And we didn't even know that this heavily used cluster was actually a GPU cluster. So uh, that was basically this heavily used cluster was a kind of a waste. And so this is, this is an example of what is called an Indian Jugaad. So Jugaad is an Indian word. It tells you that you somehow do with whatever you have. So we, of course, want uh, <laughs> this. We want a Harley Davidson. And this is made of boots. So this is quite curious. This is bootstrap. So the, the wheels are actually made of thrown away boots. And so this is actually what we have, roughly speaking. I think that is the analogy. But maybe because we are trying to make do with what we have, we will we will be forced to think about uh, things in a different way. So maybe necessity here will be the mother of invention. And so there are more questions. So you can have a look. Uh, uh, so you can solve chiral perturbation theory like we did. The epsilon expansion can be also try to do chiral perturbation theory analytically in the bootstrap. Uh, so there are the signs of regia behavior, any sign of string, so on. Of course, a more interesting question, this is what I think uh, some of you would like to take into account, are you have to take into account massless states. And I think it is possible, but it is difficult right now. Right? It's possible. Uh, you can try to connect with the CFT story so that you know you're, you literally have uh, five to the fourth theory for any lambda, but you're approaching the critical point. So that story should be there in this program as well. You, you can take into account external spins, at least the quantum, quantum information theoretic measure that we have. Uh, you can easily take it, take this into account in our paper. We have general formulas for that. Uh, so this should be, it should be possible to look at relative entropy. So for instance, in proton-proton uh, scattering, which would be relevant for LHC. And I'm pretty sure you can think about cleverer things to do with quantum information theory. I mean, I think we, we've not even scratched the surface. I think there are, this is substantially more to do. Um, and of course, the real question is really, can we come up with a framework which does away with the quantum field? The Quantum field theory framework was very useful for, for a variety of reasons. And my hunch is it's very unlikely that we'll be able to talk purely in terms of the bootstrap. And I think that we will have to find a middle road. Maybe that is going to shed some light as to how to make this more constraining as well. So thank you very much for listening. So whoever was there from the beginning till the end, on shell in the definition of on shell that uh, I gave in the pictures uh, right in the beginning, uh, I, I want to especially thank you. And apologies to those who went off shell, basically went <laughs> fell asleep. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, yeah, like, we have to clap for him for giving such a excellent talk. And uh, it's a great overview. So, um, yeah, like, you guys can ask questions, but that shouldn't be go for long because you have already asked many questions throughout the talk. Very short question I can allow. Well, I have a very short remark. Yes. Uh, the, uh, much, uh, the, the SU2, the isospins started with Heisenberg. 
after the yeah. chaos were discovered, he was looking uh, for a larger group. And for crazy reasons, he hit, hit up on, on conformal symmetry. Ah, so, okay. uh, uh, one of his students, Castro, uh, took that over. He was the teacher of Mack, and he went uh, to visit Polyakov. And when you look at Polyakov's paper, you see that a lot of uh, that came out uh, of, of their discussions on, on conformal symmetry. I see. Thank you. That, I, I, will, I will look into that. It's very interesting. So you, you have mentioned about off-shell, on-shell. So off-shell yeah. was Subir Sajdev. He was there after one hour he left. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of people, your students are all already there. I have seen that. Whoever is, uh, yeah, like part of the asymmetric bootstrap. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I and think they, are, they, they were there for politeness. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and thank you for your time. Uh, it's a really nice talk and I will be uploaded immediately and I will share the link. And those who are, want to access this, go to YouTube and type QA STM seminar series, you will get all the seminar. So by the way, this, this, this was the 20th seminar uh, in the uh, QA STM seminar series. Next talk will be given by James Shuley from uh, British Columbia next month. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, stay safe and healthy and uh, have a nice time. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, some people are commenting regarding uh, some mathematical representation theory of yeah. league group. So those who are the participant, please look into that. Uh, I don't know who is this guy, but commenting on some math, mathematics side. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so see you all. all. Stay safe. Yeah. Uh, Thank you.